All right, good morning. Uh, day last, we're actually ahead of schedule. Um, and we've got two agenda items, C7 and C8. I'll turn to our executive director, Merrick Burden, for any announcements. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, we are on the last day. We've got a couple of couple of uh, agenda items to finish out the meeting uh, this week. But for starters, um, checkout time today is at noon. Um, I understand that we will see how the morning goes and then uh, may power through or may uh, take a long break to make sure we can make that check out. Um, let's see, announcement on the COVID front. Um, I have not heard of any new um, cases that have arisen since yesterday. Um, and the two items we do have to work through today are membership appointments and council operating procedures, and then future council meeting agenda and workload planning. Um, and uh, should be an interesting discussion. Um, look forward to the rest of the day. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right. Well, let's get started with the C7. I'll turn to Deputy Director Mike Berner for an overview. Thank you, Chair Gronick. Good morning, Council members. Agenda item C7 is typically where the Council takes a look at uh, membership appointments and reviews our Council operating procedures to make sure they're up to speed and contemporary. Um, I've got a few things to work through here, so bear with me. We've got quite a varied list of things to take care of here this morning. Uh, I'll start off with uh, council officers, members, and designees. We did receive two letters, which are in your briefing materials. Uh, one from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Director, Mr. Kurt Melcher, uh, advising the council of uh, some changes to the designees to their list, adding Ms. Jessica Watson, who's been at the table this week. A welcome addition. Uh, no, no further council action on that one, obviously. Additionally, we got a letter from Dr. Scott Rumsey, notifying the council that National Marine Fishery Service uh, has made some changes to their designees for their seat, adding Ms. Maggie Summer and Mr. Josh Lindsay. And again, no further council action there. Uh, I would just note that Ms. Jessica Watson is currently a member of the Ad Hoc Ecosystem of Work Group and the Highly Migratory Species Management Team. Uh, we've, uh, it's my understanding that Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is working on some job rotational things to cover some of these duties, and I anticipate we will hear from, uh, from Oregon uh, down the road there, and I don't anticipate uh, much more business on that here at this session, but um, something we will probably likely be talking about down the road. Additionally, Ms. Summer uh, serves as the Council's representative on the International Pacific Halibut Commission's Management Strategy Advisory Board. Um, and is also on the ad hoc sablefish management team, uh, excuse me, the ad hoc SAMTAC. Um, the council might, uh, did, did discuss these uh, earlier in the week. It's my understanding that uh, Chair Grelnick is prepared to speak to a uh, potential appointment to the IPHC Management Strategy of, uh, Advisory Board. And we'll hear a little bit more about SAMTAC uh, later in this agenda. Uh, every June, the council uh, looks to election of the council chair and vice chairs. Uh, so the chair and up to two vice chairs are elected by majority of vote of the, of the council here every June. Um, officers serve a one year term, which start uh, in August and end in August of the following year. Uh, appointments can be re renewed uh, for one additional term, but the chair may not serve more than two consecutive one year terms per COP1. Uh, Chair Gorelnik uh, and Vice Chair Brad Pettinger have been in the, are in their second term now as Chair and Vice Chair, so we'll be looking to discuss that in a, in a motion uh, for the Council's guidance, and we'll get to Council action there. Regarding our advisory bodies, we have uh, some appointments to take care of on the Habitat Committee. Uh, the Council solicited nominations for uh, either a Northwest or Columbia River Tribal Representative position for the Habitat Committee. Uh, we received two nominations in your briefing materials. Uh, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation have nominated Ms. Shannon Adams, and those materials are in closed session uh, or distributed earlier in the week. And the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation has nominated Mr. Casey Baldwin. So we'd be looking to the council uh, for a motion to fill, fill that tribal seat. Additionally, for the Habitat Committee, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has no nominated Ms. Coriana Flannery to the CDFW position on that group, currently held by Mr. Eric Wilkins. And uh, again, on the Habitat Committee, the, the National Marine Fisheries Service has nominated Mr. Eric Chavez to their vacant West Coast region position. Uh, so we'd be looking to, for motions to fill those three seats on the Habitat Committee when we get to council action. 
Uh, regarding the ground fish advisory sub panel, the council also solicited for a vacant at large processor position there, and we received one nomination from Mr. Mike Okineski. Regarding stock definitions, I put this in here as just sort of a reminder of some of the business we've had in the spring regarding um, stock definitions and the possibility of, of forming an ad hoc group here per some discussions we've had it this week. Um, that decision is still uh, sort of pending, so I don't anticipate any further action uh, under this agenda item on forming a group in that regard. Uh, and just by way of updates, periodically the council staff uh, looks through our ad hoc work groups to see if there's uh, any groups that have completed their business. Those ad hoc groups obviously are generally uh, formed for a short term for a specific task. Uh, and council staff is uh, recommending that the ad hoc Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho work group has completed its business and assigned tasks. And the council staff is advising that the, the council decommission this work group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Regarding remaining vac vacancies, I'd just like to highlight for everyone that we still have a few vacancies uh, for this uh, ongoing term of our term limited advisory groups. And unless I hear other uh, guidance from the council around the table here this morning, the council staff intends to open nominations for the following uh, four seats uh, to be potentially filled in September, depending on the nominations we get. On the Coastal Plastic Species Advisory Subpanel, we have a vacancy for the Washington Charter position. Regarding the Salmon Advisory Subpanel, we have a uh, Washington Charter Operator position. Did I say charter in the first one? It's commercial, sorry. Washington Commercial position on the CPSAS. Uh, Washington Charter Operator for the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. We have a Sport Fishery Representative vacancy on the Habitat Committee and one at large vacancy for the SSC. So again, I don't really need a motion or anything here, but and unless I hear something differently here, we, we will proceed with uh, soliciting nominations for your consideration in September. Uh, also under these agenda items, we look to our council operating procedures and any updates that are needed there uh, per your April meeting under some discussions we had in the coastal pelagic species realm. There are recommendations to modify our COP 23 regarding protocols for consideration of exempted fishing permits for coastal pelagics. Uh, the revisions focus on largely on how the scientific and statistical committee gets folded into that review, sort of mirroring some of our other COPs whereby the management team would take the first look at those uh, and determine if there are, are substantial uh, scientific or statistic questions for the SSE to review. Um, and also some other housekeeping business to align the schedule more with uh, current practices. So that is in your briefing materials. And there's a few uh, advisory body uh, reports on that. So we would be looking to a motion to adopt those amendments to that COP uh, if the council uh, chooses to go that direction. Uh, in your briefing materials, like I mentioned, attachment one and two are the letters regarding council designees. Uh, attachment three is the strikeout and underlined version of COP 23 regarding the uh, exempted fishing permits for coastal pelagics. We have three tribal reports. We have one from the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, tribal report one, speaking to uh, their a vacancy on that group and their thoughts on the model evaluation work group. Uh, supplemental Tribal Report 2 is a letter from the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation uh, speaking to the nomination for the Habitat Committee and in support of uh, Ms. Adams. And Tribal Report 3 is a letter from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation uh, with supporting documentation for, again, that Habitat Committee uh, nomination. Uh, it's, I think uh, Mr. Oatman is going to speak to Tribal Report 1. I'm not sure Tribal Report 2 uh, is, it has, there's oral remarks there, but I, again, I defer to, defer, defer to Joe on that one. Uh, and we have uh, a presenter for Tribal Report 3 as well. Uh, regarding advisory body reports, there are four uh, in the supplemental materials for your consideration. Uh, the SSC and the Groundfish Management Team have reports that speak to vacancies uh, on their groups. Uh, and the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team and inf enforcement consultants have report, excuse me, reports that speak to uh, the council operating procedure I mentioned earlier. So with that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that concludes my overview. I have to take questions. That's quite a lot. Are there any questions of Mike on the overview? All right, thank you very much.
So we will uh, get started with our list of reports and I'll turn first to Joe Oatman for a tribal report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the first um, tribal report that I would like to uh, address is the would be under uh, agenda item 7C, a supplemental tribal report one. This is the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission statement on the model evaluation work group vacancy. The Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission provides the following perspectives on the model evaluation work group to inspire thought on how best to serve the needs of the council relative to reviews of fisheries regulation assessment model or FRAM and related salmon modeling to ensure that they reflect the best scientific information available. The comments are about the function of the model evaluation work group and provide some of the rationale for why the Northwest Indian Fish Commission has not filled the vacancy on the model evaluation work group and not a reflection on the work group members or staff involved. The model evaluation work group is a body that did not fulfill its original mission and currently does not have a defined function as an advisory body to the council. The model evaluation work group was originally established with a focus on one task, which was to produce documentation for the Chinook and Coho Fram models. That task has never been completed. Recent work to develop documentation for FRAM has been done outside the council process, led by analysts with WDFW, who are not part of the model evaluation the work group, and supported by other members of the state and tribal co-managers, Salmon Modeling Analytic Work Group, or SMOG. Besides the original task of providing documentation for the FRAM, uh, the model evaluation work group is tasked with participating in the annual salmon methodology review with the STT and SSC salmon subcommittee. This leads to the inadvertent misrepresentation of who is conducting the reviews or producing the material. In fact, many of the work products that have recently come to the council from the model evaluation work group our co-manager staff work products that are developed outside the council process, which are then repackaged or presented to the council through the model evaluation work group. Similarly, recently assigned work is being done not by the model evaluation work group, but by the SMOG, such as additional FRAM documentation and analyses to support proposed changes to the Schnick salmon thresholds. The work on the Southern Resident Killer Whale abundance modeling to support development of a management threshold was done primarily by co-manager analysts who were not part of the model evaluation work group. In essence, uh, only one of the analysts from NIMPS who developed the modeling is on the work group. The proponents of any new FRAM methodology should, represent, should present their proposed changes to the Council Scientific and Statistical Committee and SAM technical team. In essence, for scientific review and consideration of technical aspects of implementation, respectively. For review prior to adoption for use by the Council, this would better meet the need for a thorough and defensible independent scientific and technical review. This also would be more in keeping with the fact that the ownership of the firm resides with the state and tribal co-managers and not PFMC. If the model evaluation work group is to continue, then its membership structure, responsibilities and tasks, as well as its operating procedures require careful consideration, review and revision. It needs to be populated with a more diverse membership that have the appropriate skill sets and develop work products based on a defined need that is not redundant to co-manager efforts or the SSC or STT's reviews. It would benefit from work sessions to complete assigned tasks so that members who are not part of SMOG can be more involved. The model evaluation work group in its current form falls short of this. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, that, that concludes uh, my reading of the uh, statement. 
All right, thank you. Are there any questions for Joe on the statement? Thank you very much. Are there any, any further trouble reports that you wish to present? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, there are um, a, another um, trouble report. I'm not going to uh, read that for the record, but I just do want to acknowledge that we received under agenda item C7A, the supplemental tribal report two uh, that was submitted to us by the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation uh, in support of the Yakima uh, nominee, uh, Ms. Adams, for the Habitat Committee. I would just like to refer the council to that. All right, thank you. And just to give folks um, a final opportunity to any questions of Joe, there is another uh, report. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do you have a question? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a question, but I'm assuming we'll be able to have some discussion about um, tribal report from the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission concerning the MU under council discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have an, a further report from the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. And I have Jared Erickson. Jared, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? I heard you. Yeah. There you go. Okay, I just wanna make sure. All right, good morning, council. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Jared Michael Erickson. I'm a Councilman for the Call of the Confederated Tribes. I'm also our Natural Resource and Fisheries Chairman. I'd like to provide an oral testimony today. Um, the, Col the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, or the Colville Tribes, consists of 12 tribes whose homeland cover much of eastern Washington. The Colville Tribes federally recognized and protected fishing rights to fisheries that are impacted by the management of the Pacific Fisheries and Marine Council. Every year, the Colville Tribe receives a specific allocation of salmon from the fisheries managed by the PFMC and does clearly have an acknowledged protectable interest. The completion of the Grand Coulee Dam in the 1940s and later the Chief Joseph Dam by the federal government irrevocably altered the Colville tribe's way of life and significantly impacted our access to traditional foods, including the salmon. The Colville tribes do not have access to salmon above these dams, but the right to access this important food along the Columbia River and its tributaries have been fought for and upheld. Even though promises continue to be made by the federal government that will that will help mitigate the damage caused by these dams to the Colville tribes, mere promises are not enough. The only way for Colville tribes to continue to protect our way of lives and our rights is to actually participate in processes that have significant impacts. The tribes of the Confederated, the 12 tribes of the Confederated tribes of the Colville Reservation are all salmon peoples. Salmon are extremely important for our culture, spiritual needs, and subsistence. We have been fishing the waters of Eastern Washington since time immemorial. Exercising our fishing rights and protecting the health and welfare of our people, including the culture, is critical to the tribes. To that end, the tribes have taken the policy position that they may participate in processes related to the PFMC as is our right and obligation. Additionally, we seek to increase the population of the salmon throughout the system, including reintroduction in the blocked area behind Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dam. The PFMC was created by the Magnuson Stevens Act and, is required, and it requires that the secretary appoint to the PFMC one representative of a, and I quote, an Indian tribe with federally recognized fishing rights from California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. PFMC operating procedures mirrors this language. Nothing in these provisions makes a distinction between the type of tribe, treaty, or executive order. Nothing in the act or provisions would limit the ability of any tribe that has federally protected interests from participating in the process or holding these seats on the committees, subcommittees, subpanels, advisory boards, et cetera. The federal tribes of the Colville Reservation is a Columbia River tribe, is a tribe whose history is tied to the, is a tribe who our history is tied to the Columbia River, whose reservation sits on the Columbia River. Um, and as you mo most of you know, has more than 150 river miles that our uh, reservation sits on. We're only one of the two tribes whose reservation sits on and includes a portion of the Columbia River, the others being the Spokane tribe of Indians. There's no difference between the right affirmed by executive order, statute, or treaty. As such, the Colville tribes have the right to participate fully in the PFMC process. The tribes are entitled to meaningful participation in the PFMC process as recognized by Columbia River Tribe 
but it's fairly protective fishing rights at all levels. And for this body to assert otherwise is contrary to the statute established in this body and the operating procedures of this body. The Habitat Committee has, a, has not had a tribal representative for many years and advertised for the Columbia River Tribe to fill the seat in November of 2021. The Confederate Tribes of the Culver Reservation nominated Casey Baldwin for the position in November of 2021. The PFMC did not appoint Mr. Baldwin to the committee despite having no other candidates and instead reopened the position. And as Mr. Oman just stated, that they're trying to fill that with the tree tribe individual now. When this wasn't filled prior, we nominated Casey last year. In March 2022, Mr. Baldwin again was the only nominee, and again, the PFC took no action and reopened the position. The PFMC provided no reasoning for why it failed to consider the Call of the Tribes nomination when Mr. Baldwin was qualified and eligible for the position. In June 2022, Mr. Baldwin was, was again nominated by the Call of the Tribes for the Habitat Committee position. Mr. Baldwin would be an asset to Habitat Committee as a representative for the Columbia River tribal interest. Casey is a research scientist with a master's degree in fisheries and 19 years of experience working on salmon recovery and habitat restoration in the Columbia River Basin. It is disappointing that, th that this has become an issue and the Colville Tribes request that the PFMC take the opportunity to handle this continued unnecessary delay and appoint Casey Baldwin to the Habitat Committee. By accepting Mr. Baldwin's nomination, the Habitat Committee will receive a highly qualified candidate who can provide a different perspective as a representative of one of the only Columbia River Tribes directly impacted by the Columbia River. We look forward to the opportunity to continue participating fully in the PFMC processes to protect the tribe's fairly recognized and protected rights, but also to improve the stocks for all future, all users in the future. We appreciate the council's consideration of our request that you accept the Colville tribe's right to participate fully and nominate qualified representatives in the same manner as other Columbia River tribes with federally protected interest. And thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Mr. Erickson. Are there any questions on this report? All right, thank you very much. We'll next hear um, from the SSC and John DeVore, I believe, is providing that report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. I'll be reading uh, agenda item C7A supplemental SSC report one on behalf of the SSC. The SSC discussed the current vacant at-large SSC seat and recommends the council solicit nominations to fill that seat. The SSC recommends nominees have expertise in stock assessments. Specifically, the SSC needs candidates that are willing to contribute to robust assessment reviews in 2023 and beyond. The SSC recommends the solicitation characterize the time commitment for this position with an expectation that the nominee commits to attending five SSC meetings per year, one or more stock assessment review panel meetings, and at least two SSC ground fish subcommittee meetings per year. Candidates with knowledge of oceanography and marine ecosystem modeling are also encouraged to apply. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, John. Are there any questions on the SSC report? Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeVore. Um, the recommendation is for expertise in stock assessments, but then the rest of the statement seems to suggest that the expertise desired is really in ground fish stock assessments. Maybe you can clarify for us. Yes, um, they, they want someone who has a general knowledge of stock assessments. Uh, clearly that last part was in recognition that the uh, ground fish stock assessment review cycle is especially, um, uh, it needs a lot of resources, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a ground fish expert that applies to the meeting. And, and that was clarified in the discussion by the SSC. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. All right, any other questions on uh, the SSC report? All right, thank you very much, John. Next, the ground fish management team, Katie Pearson. Welcome, Katie. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. I'm Katie Pearson and I will be reading Supplemental GMT Report 1. The Ground Fish Management Team discussed the current vacant Southwest Fisheries Science Center, Science Center seat, that has been unfilled since January 2021. We understand that this is because of capacity limitations at the Science Center, but we request that the Council consider filling the, that seat. We also note that the team has been without an economist or social scientist and feels the lack of that expertise in our discussions and statements, particularly on economically impactful items like gear switching. And that concludes our report. Thank you very much, Katie. Are there any questions on the GMT report? All right, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, we'll now have the CPS management team report. Alan Sarich. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning. So the, the coastal pelagic species management team reviewed the draft language prepared by council staff in attachment three and agrees with the proposed edits to council operating procedure 23 to better align with council scheduling and only require SSC review if additional scientific scrutiny is warranted. The approval process for CPS exempted fishing permit applications should be more streamlined following the revised COP. And I will add that the team has not had an opportunity to review and discuss the EC report. All right, thank you. Any questions of the team on that report? All right, thank you very much. Now, uh, the enforcement consultants, Greg Bush. Welcome, Greg. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. I'm Greg Bush with National Marine Fisheries Service Office of Law Enforcement. Chair of the Enforcement Consultants, and I'll be reading agenda item C7A, Supplemental EC Report 1. Enforcement Consultants Report and Membership Appointments and Council Operating Procedures. The Enforcement Consultants have reviewed the documents associated with agenda item C7, Membership Appointments and Council Operating Procedures, and provide the following comments. Regarding C7, Attachment 3, COP23 Proposal, the EC recommend the addition of language indicating a violation history check may be considered by the National Marine Fisheries Service when evaluating whether or not to issue an exempted fishing permit. Consideration of prior violations is included in several EFP COPs, see COP 19, 20, and 24. The EC recommends the following language be added to COP 23. D, other considerations. One, EFP candidates or participants may be denied future EFP permits under the following circumstances. A, if the applicant participant, fisher processor, has violated past EFP provisions or has been convicted of a crime related to commercial fishing regulations punishable by a maximum penalty range exceeding $1,000 within the last three years. B, within the last three years, assessed a civil penalty related to a violation of commercial fishing regulations in an amount greater than $5,750. Or C, has been assessed a civil penalty or been convicted of a crime involving the falsification of fish receiving tickets, including, but not limited to, misreporting or underreporting of CPS. The EC recognizes the violation history check is not mandatory, but it does serve as a motivation for compliance and provides NIMS with important information when considering whether or not to issue an EFP. NIMS Officer Law Enforcement conducts the violation history checks contained within COPS 19, 20, and 24 for NIMS outside the normal council process. This concludes the EC statement. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Are there any questions from the council on the EC statement? All right, thanks very much, Greg. <clears throat> well, that concludes uh, all of our reports and takes us to council discussion and action. So let's start with some discussion. And I know that Mr. Anderson um, indicated inter an interest in discussing the travel report on the Muse, I assume. So <laughs> let me first turn to Mr. Anderson to get us started. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I want to spend just maybe a little bit of time uh, on this topic. Uh, it's an important topic. Um, I take to, to heart the um, perspectives that were conveyed by the Northwest of, of thought about what to do in response to, uh, to that um, perspective and view about the MU and the future of the MU. Um, as we all know, the Salmon Model Evaluation Work Group is an advisory body to the, to the Council. Um, my understanding of their primary objectives include identify, analyze, present, and review methodologies affecting salmon modeling, um, facilitate technical dispute resolution over methodologies, provide documentation and education of the FRAM model, the main model used to assess impacts on Chinook and Coho salmon stocks in the PFMC for, forum, particularly um, off Washington and, and uh, Oregon. And they serve as a conduit between the PFMC and the other entities involved in uh, methodology review, certainly including uh, the tribes the, uh, and the, the two commissions. The MU has one um, official meeting per year. I uh, believe it usually occurs first day of the April Council process and then other meetings are scheduled as needed to prepare for um, the October methodology review uh, cycle. Uh, we have, you know, we've got a um, pretty broad representation in terms of the members um, and um, including members from Idaho, Oregon, Washington, NIMPS and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and the Columbia River and Tribal Fish Commission and the California Department of, of Fish and Wildlife. Those last three uh, are currently vacant. I think uh, from, from uh, my vantage point, uh, which, which may not have a 360 degree uh, view uh, that most of the FRAM expertise on the MU resides with John Carey from National Marine Fishery Service and, and Gila Cahagenbro from WDFW. Uh, they're also both members of the Salmon Modeling Analytical Work Group. Um, and due to the co-managerial nature of salmon management, the MU members work closely with experts and stakeholders outside the MU process to facilitate the production of materials for methodology review. Many of those materials are presented um, at the methodology review are created in collaboration with non-MU members. Um, some of the materials are produced solely uh, outside and by outside entities. Uh, and when MU members are not the main analysts or presenters, MU staff coordinate with those topic experts and act as a conduit for information and materials into the council forum. You know, of the, of the topics and, and uh, things that we've asked the MU to do over time, one of them, uh, they have played an instrumental role in, in producing the online FRAM user model and the FRAM overview documentation um, both these documents were developed with significant contributions uh, from the Salmon uh, Modeling Analytical Work Group. However, I believe those efforts were primarily led by Angela Cahagenbro, who serves as the chair of the MU. So I think in looking ahead and, and considering the, the um, uh, concerns that were conveyed by the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. You know, we, we need to think about some the pros and cons of, of the MU. And at least a short uh, list of those, you know, when I think about the pros uh, uh, of having a MU, 
uh, a, a group uh, that their members uh, elevate and prioritize issues of interest to the PFMC. As I mentioned, and they've and served as an important conduit uh, between PFMC and FRAM experts. Um, they've been a small and committed work group that produces results um, with uh, few PFMC resources uh, added. Uh, I think the group considers and issues affecting all the states, including the PFMC process. And they're a dedicated forum for methodology review topic se uh, selection, and we've certainly had uh, a a number of methodology issues come up within our salmon management process that I think they've contributed to. On the other side, I think that, you know, there's not enough um, new members with FRAM expertise, and some of that is a result of the vacancies that we have. Um, you know, I'm very concerned about having such a group with, with, that lacks the tribal representation and as I mentioned, those two seats that are on there have been vacant and vacant for some time. And we've received some explanation as to why, at least from the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, they've left those positions vacant. Um, I understand that uh, the mission of the view can be vague and ambiguous. And I think that was one of the criticisms in the, from the Northwest Indian Fisheries uh, commission and there's difficulty in navigating stakeholders that are outside the MU entities. Um, uh, and a lot of times the MU needs to consult with those outside entity entities to, to uh, create their products. And then there's just the scarcity of time and resources to fill uh, the positions on the, and the MU. Um, so all that is to say that I think, um, I, I think I can safely say that the uh, viewpoint that was expressed in by the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission on the MU came as a bit of a surprise, and that may be an understatement. To uh, I know at least the people on from WDFW that are on the MU and have participated on the MU for a long time, and so I would, you know. Um, I, I think we need to give um, uh, careful consideration to the perspectives that were brought forward uh, by the tribes on the on the MU and and it and the future of the MU. I would suggest that we um, uh, uh, stand down on trying to uh, make any decisions uh, to let uh, some conversations take place between. Um, those entities, the tribes and the states and the National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, those folks that uh, make up the MU um, and, and, and look to them to come, hopefully, come back to us with a perspective and, or perhaps a recommendation on the future of the MU. Um, but I don't, I, I think, I think it's important that we leave some space for those conversations to occur. And so that in, is my recommendation relative to having a council response uh, to the perspectives on the MU that have been offered by the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Thanks for giving me the time to walk through that. Thank you very much. Um, let's stay on this topic and see if we can reach a a council a consensus on how to address this. Um, any, well, we've heard from Phil. I think it, personally, I think it's very reasonable. So there need to be some offline discussions about this. And uh, at some point it can come back to the council um, and for, for a decision or not. But first we need to have those discussions. Is that uh, Pete Hassemer? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I don't know what the process is to go forward. I certainly would defer to Phil on this and appreciate the, the comments he provided and the overview 
on that. I, I do believe it takes some thinking before we make a decision on this. One thing I saw in the letter, the viewpoints were maybe two divergent ways to approach this. The last paragraph in that letter talks about if the MU were to continue, do this. But the prior paragraph talked about a different way of doing business and getting the review. And what I guess picked my interest there was that they referenced it as a better way of getting the information or scientifically defensible information we need. So I, I can't judge whether or not that's true. And I think that's where it's worth time to see if there is something better that the council can do and whether that could be rolled into the MUSE responsibility. So in short, again, um, I think the pros and cons that Phil talked about with respect to this and taking a step back and giving it some thought, you know, how exactly we do that, I don't know, but that's the way to go. Thank you. And Mr. Oatman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, do want to um, acknowledge the uh, remarks and suggestion that, that Phil made, as well as uh, additional comments uh, provided by Pete. Um, so I, I just want to um, uh, convey uh, that, you know, it's my understanding that, you know, this seat has been, uh, the seat for the uh, Northwest Indian Fish Commission has been vacant for uh, some time. I think it's, you know, taken some time for them to uh, provide some, you know, explanation as to why that's the case. And so I think they've laid out, you know, the issues uh, uh, for that uh, in their um, uh, report. And so I, I think, you know, it's one that has been a, a concern as well as a challenge as to, you know, how best to, you um, you know, operate within the council process. Um, you know, they have the, the co-manager uh, process that they work work in. Um, you know, from their perspective, you know, they think that the model evaluation work group um, is one where, you know, could be redundant to, you know, their part of uh, doing this type of work. And so I, I think, um, you know, part of the intent here was to, um, you know, lay out, you know, the concerns that, that they have uh, with respect uh, to the model evaluation work group and provide some suggestions on, um, you know, how we might um, rethink things uh, from their perspective. And so I, I do appreciate that, um, you know, getting some additional uh, time to kind of think this through and have some additional discussions as to, you know, what might be the, the best way to address this is a good one. Um, and I think they would respect that. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we'll not take any action at this time, but um, I don't know if this is something that uh, during our next agenda item, folks may want to uh, uh, agendize for a future discussion. Is there any further discussion on this topic? Mr. Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I do know um, Kyle Attucks is online. Um, what that's here. Um, Chris Kern maybe as well. Um, and I just, I, I don't know if they, I'm sure if they had something they had, they'd raise their hand, but I just wanted to note that they were, um, well, I know Kyle at least is um, attending remotely. And I didn't know if he had any other kinds of perspectives um, beyond what I had uh, put on the table for consideration. All right, we'll give a moment to raise a hand if there are some thoughts to be offered at this time. But I'm not seeing a hand, so. We'll, we'll take this up down the road. Um, further discussion uh, ahead of any motions on this agenda item. Um, 
I know that there are some, we have received a recommendation from staff that uh, certain open seats be uh, re-noticed. I don't think there should be any controversy about that, provided, providing that guidance to staff. And um, I think we'll take up um, nominations and then, well, there's some hands have gone up. Uh, on my list, I have Marcy and then Kyle. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll defer to Kyle and we, we can wrap that talk, topic up first. Thank you. All right, Kyle, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Apologies. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. I was struggling to find the, the raise hand buttons. Things have moved around a little in Ring Central, I think, since last I used it. I, I really didn't have anything to add um, to what Mr. Anderson said. Um, I'd had some communication with Angelica, our MU representative, um, on her thoughts on the subject. And um, as, as Phil said, I think we need some time to, to talk through it with the co-managers and the other states and, and figure out the best path forward. I think that MU does play a very valuable role. If we need a little more structure to, to what they're doing, then, then I'm all for that. But um, as, as Phil said, I think we need a little more time to, to figure out the best path forward. All right, thank you, Kyle. Marcy, do you have something to add? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm on a different topic. I, I heard you say that we were going to close this agenda item out, and I wanted to take up the question of COP23. Um, I, I think, let me see if there's anything further on the MU. Okay, we have closed that action, that subject out, and uh, please go ahead, Marcy, on a further topic. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe we heard from the CPSMT that they um, had not had a chance to consider the EC's recommendations on amendment to COP23. So my question is, um, I assume council staff has had an opportunity to think about the EC statement and maybe they might advise us on the path forward uh, regarding COP23. All right. Well, I guess that's a consideration for the council if we haven't had adequate input from that advisory body. Uh, I was going to start with nominations, come back to COP23, but let's deal with this now that it's been raised. Um, what is the sense of the council on COP23 to, to defer until we've given that advisory body an opportunity to provide input or does the council want to move ahead? looking for some guidance from the council. Mr. Wolf. Um, I don't have, thank you, Mr. Chair, I don't have guidance, but before we started the discussion, we heard a number of reports that have recommended additions to this or comments on it. <clears throat> so I just wanted to throw out there for consideration if anyone has a motion or um, at least note if we are going to amend this, and this is a very minor point. Uh, but in the second paragraph under general process, uh, if we are going to amend this cup, it would help to remove the references to NIMS Southwest region and turn that to NIMS West Coast region. Thank you. Fair enough. What is uh, uh, Heather Hall? Thank you, Chair Gronlick. Um I'll just add to this um, discussion here. We, I, I think the recommendation from the EC on revising the COP makes sense as Marcy, Marcy's bringing up. I, I, I was unsure if we needed a motion to do that, but also the point that um, Marcy mentioned that and that we heard from the advisory sub panel report that they really hadn't had time to consider it might um, allow us to take up this change to the COP at another meeting when they've had time to provide that input. Um, so maybe not at this meeting, but at a future meeting, we could um, consider that change to the COP. Yeah, I'm not aware of any, that these changes are time critical, but uh, I may not be close enough to the issue. Is there a sense that there's a, 
a timing issue that we need to move forward with this at this meeting or whether can we, can we defer this to a future meeting to give the advisory body an opportunity? Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I just address a couple of things I just heard. I, I don't believe this is terribly urgent. Uh, on the other hand, I guess from my own perspective, the comments we heard from the EC are in keeping with practices and some of our other COPs regarding the review of EFPs. And, and from my perspective, their comments are pretty squarely uh, within the enforcement uh, camp, if you will, in terms of input. We, uh, I'm not sure if the chair of the management team is still on in line and, and perhaps we could confer with them. But I guess in my mind, coming into this agenda item, I, 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 it seemed reasonable to me to proceed with, the, with this addition to the COP at this session. But I, I defer to the council on that. I'm looking for a hand. I, oh, my hand has gone up. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in light of that discussion and hearing that there is no urgency, it might be worthwhile to see a revised, marked up version of the proposed text of COP23 that we can act on at the September meeting. Um, in light of uh, remarks from Mr. Wolf, uh, as well as the opportunity for um, MT review and recommendation. Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, our CPS advisor just told me that it would be best if we had this in place by November. So I think that would be appropriate if we took another look at this at September, that would not cause any timing issues. Thank you. I was just noticing we don't have CPS on the agenda in September, but we do in November. So is that acceptable to the council to defer this to November? I want to see if there's any objection to doing that. Marcy, your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you. You're, you're right about the September not having CPS on the agenda, but it, I believe we'd take this up under... Um, admin and membership appointments and COPs. So I don't know if it, um, if the fact that CPS teams aren't uh, scheduled to meet that we couldn't take it up in September, but maybe Mr. Berner might clarify. Thanks. Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it's my understanding that the CPS advisory bodies are planning a webinar just in advance of the September meeting, even though there's not coastal pelagic species items on there to discuss things such as this. So they'll get a chance then to see them. All right. So September, we'll do it in September since they're going to be meeting anyway in advance of the September meeting. So is that okay with everyone? All right, good. So we'll come back to CFP 23 in September. So uh, I think with the CO, that was the only COP action item we had. So we'll go to see if there's any discussion in advance of motions on a number of appointments we need to make. And I'm not seeing any hands. So I think that um, this was, a, some of these were discussed in um, closed session and some not. Let me just first say that um, I'm pleased uh, to appoint Heather Hall as the council representative to the International Pacific Halibut Commission Management Strategy Advisory Board. I wanna thank you very much in advance for your service there on behalf of the council. Um, and now I'll look for a motion uh, regarding uh, COP1. Mr. Anderson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Sandra, for reading my mind again. Um, I move the council suspend the provision of council operating procedure one that states that the chair may not serve more than two consecutive one year terms. All right, the language on the screen is accurate and complete. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Heather Hall. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
putting this before the council for consideration so that we can have uh, flexibility in our consideration of electing our council chair and vice chair or chairs as the case may be uh, when we get to that uh, to that action um, this does not um, necessarily mean that we will deviate from that procedure um, but it does give us the flexibility to consider our situation what's best for the council in terms of a leadership position uh, leadership perspective and so that's the reason I'm putting this before the council for consideration. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, not seeing any hands, I uh, will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Phil. Uh, now, we should turn to the election of our council chair and vice chair for the coming year. And Bob Dooley, you have a motion for us? I do, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Um, I think there it is. I move that Mr. Mark Gronick serve as council chair and Mr. Brad Pettinger and Mr. Pete Hassemer serve as council vice chairs for the August 11th, 2022 through the August 10th, 2023 term. All right, the language on the screen is accurate and complete. Yes, it is. And I'll look for a second, seconded by Butch Smith. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I bring this before the council to uh, suggest that we have gone through some very difficult times in the, in the last few years. You recall March of 2020 in, in Rohnert Park that uh, when Mr. Anderson was our chair, it was the last time we, until March of 2022, that we had an in-person council meeting. Uh, Mr. Gorolnik and Mr. Pre uh, Pettinger have done an outstanding job of leading us through those dark times and bringing, bringing us through the to where we are now and then as we saw this week we may be not be done with COVID. Uh, there's also uh, the thought of, of bringing on a second vice chair. I think that uh, it's it, it, we need stability in our council leadership and we've done a, you know the, our existing leadership has done a, gr a great job. We've had uh, some changes. We have a new executive director that came on in the late last year. We have some changes. We're soliciting a new deputy director. I think our leadership needs continuity. I think we, um, that, and, and being able to extend another term would be very good in these times of when, in these transition times. I also look to last May when we were uh, chosen to host the CCC meeting in Monterey in person that did not happen. Those relationships are crucial to uh, our, our operations and our relationships with other regions. Those in-person meetings are have just resumed again. The relationships that are built in those are, are critical to, to being able to interact on a personal basis with other councils and other regions and to share uh, share views and, and things. And I think it's important that we have those. So in that, in that realm, I think we need to prepare for the future. And I think it's, it's critical to have uh, the next vice chair in the room as well for these. So I would, I, that's, that's my rationale for supporting this. I think it gets us, moves us to next year when uh, Idaho will uh, assume the role of of vice chair and Mr. Pettinger from Oregon will be the chair. I think that uh, with all the transition we have, I think it's just it's it's logical to to prepare ourselves for that and to be and to and to be supportive of this. So I offer that, and I um, I'll, I'll stop there and and have comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. 
Uh, any discussion on this motion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, now we'll turn to the travel seat on the Habitat Committee, uh, Mr. Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the council appoint Ms. Shannon Adams to the vacant Northwest or Columbia River Tribal Representative position on the Habitat Committee. The language on the screen is accurate and complete. It is, Mr. Chair. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Phil. Uh, the Yakima Nation nominated Ms. Adams to the Habitat Committee. The Yakima Nation is a tribe that has federally recognized fishing rights and are a management entity within the council process. They are part of the United States versus Oregon and United States versus Washington federal court cases addressing Indian treaty fishing rights. I understand that the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program is probably the largest uh, tribal program in the nation. They implement a large habitat restoration program with projects in certain areas of the Columbia River Basin and coordinate those efforts with other tribal, state, and federal agencies, including stakeholders. Ms. Adams is an enrolled member of the Yakima Nation as an and is employed as the habitat section coordinator in the tribes fisheries program. She has over 20 years of experience in natural resources management and assists the tribe in its environmental stewardship efforts through various management restoration and resiliency projects. She currently chairs the upper Columbia River recovery board to help guide efforts uh, to restore viable and sustainable populations of salmon, steelhead, and other at-risk species in that region. Given the experience and expertise of Ms. Adams in the area of habitat restoration, the fisheries and co-management efforts of the Yakima Nation, I support this nomination of Ms. Adams to fill the seat for the Northwest or Columbia River Tribal Representative on Habitat Committee. I do also want to acknowledge that uh, we do have a letter from the Confederate Tribe of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in support of Ms. Adams. And I also understand that the uh, Warm Springs and Nespers tribes also support this nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Joe. Are there any questions for Joe or any discussion on this motion? I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? I abstain. Who was that? Oh, Corey, Corey Reddings. Reddings. Okay, Corey Reddings abstains. All right, so the motion passes. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to just pause for a moment here and acknowledge uh, the nomination from the Colville Tribes and Mr. Casey Baldwin. Um, I've, I've um, known Casey for a long time and I've had a fair amount of experience dealing with the Colville um, Tribes and they have a, an incredible uh, natural resource department there and Casey is a very, very knowledgeable individual. And I, and I hope that um, the Colville Tribes in, will have, uh, will allow, and I hope Casey will uh, uh, participate uh, in the Habitat Committee's meetings. Um, he brings a lot of value, and I uh, wanted to acknowledge that, um, and um, and and just express my hope that um, Casey, even though he didn't get appointed to this position. Uh, will stay engaged and contribute uh, to our habitat committee because I think he he and the Colville tribes can bring a lot of value uh, from the Columbia River perspective. Thanks. All right, thank you. 
Bill. Uh, we'll next move to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the Habitat Committee. Ms. Yuremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the council appoint Ms. Coriana Flannery to the CDFW position on the Habitat Committee currently held by Mr. Eric Wilkins. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. Thank you. And I'll look for a second, seconded by Corey Ridings. Please speak to your motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're very pleased to have Corey uh, Flannery join us on the Habitat Committee. She had an opportunity to attend the HC meeting this week and participate. She has been following along with the activities of the HC now since the spring. Uh, she comes from our department's um, habitat conservation program and focuses on uh, project review. She's very familiar with a number of the projects that we've been tracking in the habitat committee and has uh, been working in her role with CDFW uh, to develop um, comments on proposals and um, just brings a, a whole wealth of knowledge and experience uh, to the process. So we expect a seamless transition and we're very happy to have Corey aboard. Thanks. All right, thank you, Marcy. Is there any, are there any questions for Marcy or any discussion on this motion? I'm not seeing any. I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Marcy, thank you for the motion. Uh, we'll next turn to the West Coast region position on the Habitat Committee, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I have a motion. I move the council appoint Mr. Eric Chavez to the vacant West Coast region position on the Habitat Committee. All right, Mr. Wolf, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. Let me see if there's a second, seconded by Pete Hassemer. Um, please speak to your motion to confirm that he did not use, did not formally play third base for the Oakland Athletics. <laughs> that is correct. This is a different, uh, Mr. Chavez. Um, and he's worked in the West Coast region, um, for 20 years, actually on a variety of roles, um, which has resulted in his current position as the West Coast region, essential fish habitat coordinator. Um, he is intimately familiar with the EFH provisions of the Magnuson Act, uh, but he also has extensive experience with the ESA, uh, with NEPA, and with the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act. And I'm extremely confident that Eric will effectively contribute to the Habitat Committee. Uh, and while I have the floor, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to take a moment to thank Mr. John Stadler, who formerly held this position uh, on the Habitat Committee, but also uh, Ms. Gretchen Hanshu, Mr. Matt Goldsworthy, and Mr. Brian Mew, all who did rotating terms as our acting EFH coordinator and participated in the work of that committee. So I wanna thank them as well. All right, thank you for the motion. Are there any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ryan, for the motion. Uh, we'll next turn to the uh, vacant processor position on the ground fish advisory sub panel. I'll turn to council member Krista Svensson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the council appoint Mr. Mike Okanowski to the vacant, vacant at large processor position on the ground fish advisory sub panel. All right, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? It is. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Corey Ridings. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. I'm pleased to nominate Mr. Okanowski for the processing seat on the gap. Uh, Mike, when I saw your nomination and realized you'd be on both the CPS and Groundfish panels, my first thought was, wow, you're an August company. One of my last conversations was with Pierre Marchand from Jesse Zelwako Fish. 
um, was around the importance of being part of the council process and that he had once served on both the CPSAS and the HMSAS at the same time. I can remember thinking, man, I'm not sure how he did that, but I was so impressed. And I'm so impressed by your willingness to take up that same level of workload and really probably more because the gap is here every meeting and extensively, um, particularly for West Coast processors. You've got an impressive skill set, your willingness to engage with other people who have a variety of viewpoints, your diligence in researching and doing the homework that comes with having this type of position. But mostly it's the fact that you're out there representing processors in the fishing industry at so many events and forums with a positive and professional approach. And that he's willing to bring that information back into the council process. Mike does an incredible job representing the processing voice here on the West Coast. And I look forward to hearing more about that um, from him at the council on the specific subject of ground fish in this, in this particular FMP, but others as well. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for Krista or any discussion on this motion? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Krista, for the motion. And I notice Mike hasn't run away from the room, so thank you, Mike. Um, we have the matter of a couple of ad hoc committees um, that we've had on the books. Uh, we have the ad hoc Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho Work Group and the ad hoc Sablefish Management and Trawl Allocation Attainment Committee otherwise known as SAMTAC. So um, do we have a, a motion pertaining to those, uh, Ms. Uremko? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the council decommission the ad hoc Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho Work Group and the ad hoc Sablefish Management and Trawl Allocation Attainment Committee. All right, and the language on the screen is accurate and complete? Yes, it is. All right, and I'll look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, these two groups served us very well in doing their work. Um, they took on a task that was uh, specific in nature and got busy and provided us um, both some technical um, work and some um, some thoughts and recommendations, but uh, their activities are complete um, in both of, of those um, venues. And um, it is time that we can uh, decommission them. And if we need um, more work on either of these topics into the future, it would uh, be appropriate to re-examine the, the objectives and duties and formation of those committees. So. Um, definitely time to um, have them stand down, but we certainly appreciate their service. Thank you. All right, thank you for the motion. Um, are there any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Marcy, for the motion. So I think that deals with all of the appointments we have and uh, the motions that I'm aware of. And we discussed uh, advertising the vacant positions. We've uh, decided to defer discussion on the MU. So I, I don't know if we're done here, but we might be. Let me just, before I call on Mr. Berner, let me see if there's anything, any members around, uh, Mr. P Pete Hassamer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, quickly express some appreciation to the council here. It's an incredible honor to be considered for and selected to join the management team. Uh, it's an amazing 
amount of talent at the front table, those that we have there, it's quite a challenge, I think, to do that. And as I think about it, um, my doing my best is not enough, that I'm committed to uh, striving to do better than my best uh, to further the work of the council. And so, uh, again, I'm honored to join that team. Thank you. Well, thanks, Pete. It'd be good to have you, and there's absolutely no pressure. So, um, anything further for the good of the council? And if not, I'll go to Mr. Berner to check in and see what I've forgotten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I believe we've completed your business. I'll just take this time to congratulate you and Mr. Pettinger and Mr. Hassamer on your elections. Uh, we will solicit those vacancies you mentioned and get that posted quickly for uh, solicitation of nominations between now and the September meeting. Uh, I do appreciate the letter from the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and the comments around the table regarding the MU. Uh, just briefly, when I was Salmon Staff Officer, I and, and the leadership of the MU at that time did sometimes struggle with their charge and, and, their, and their business. So uh, I did go back and look at the early documents back in 2003 when that group was formed and sort of the thoughts back when it was charged. And so I think I welcome a discussion on, on that group and, and how it moves forward might suggest we look to the spring meetings when we have more of our salmon advisors around if, if the council wanted to have a more detailed detailed discussion of that, but I do think that's warranted and I appreciate that. Uh, we will uh, add some of the thoughts around the table um, regarding COP23. We'll add some of that text suggested by the EC, uh, make the correction that uh, Mr. Wolf uh, mentioned and get that in the briefing book for September and have our CPS uh, management team look at that uh, and report back uh, under the administrative item then. So appreciate all the work. That was quite a list of things to take care of. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mike. So um, my inclination is to get started on F8 and maybe take a break after all of our reports and depending upon the progress we're making, it'll either be a long break so we can check out, but if we're making good progress, probably just a normal break. Um, so unless anyone wants a break right now, we'll get started on this agenda item and I'll turn to our executive director. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. Second here while I get myself organized. So this is agenda item C8, future council meeting agenda and workload planning. I would point your attention to several attachments that you have in your briefing book on this matter, several of which have, are new since the advanced briefing book was published. In particular, I would highlight supplemental attachment three, the Pacific Council workload planning preliminary year at a glance summary, also known as the YAG. Um, this has been something that uh, Mike and I and some others have been working on over the last week, listening to your discussion, um, and it is an updated YAG since the, um, the item that was in your advanced briefing book. Also, I'll flag for you the draft council meeting agenda for September, uh, the supplemental attachment four, that's also an updated um, agenda, uh, proposed agenda for September compared to the one that you saw in your advanced briefing book. We also have several other things uh, in your briefing book to consider. Um, top of the list here is the supplemental STT report. Uh, you may recall back in April, we had quite a bit of conversation and deliberation about the salmon fram model. Um, and the salmon technical team was asked to come back at workload planning on this meeting and report back on their investigations of that model. And we do have Mr. Uh, Michael O'Farrell in the audience to give that statement and report to you on the latest there. You also have several other um, uh, reports from advisory bodies, including an SSC report, a CPSMT report, an HMSAS report, an MPC report, a revised GMT report, and a supplemental gap report. Mr. Chairman, I will quickly uh, walk you all through the latest uh, September agenda and the YAG, um, and then would be happy to take any questions, but I would like to orient you to those two uh, first before I do. Um, so first, looking at the September uh, draft agenda, um, you'll notice that um, there are a couple of things here that are shaded. Uh, we do have um, research and data needs coming back to us in September that is shaded, but that has been um, on our minds for some time. 
We have a shaded item on electric monitoring. Uh, we have had some discussion here over this week about uh, both stock definitions and uh, wrapping our minds around that. That has been included uh, on September. We also have uh, related to that is the stock assessment plan. Um, there is some talk about uh, finalizing that and also a check-in on how the stock assessment process has been going. Um, and Jim Hasty has indicated that the Science Center would be, pre be prepared to uh, provide a report on that for your consideration and their progress toward uh, stock assessments. We do have a few other items that are uh, maybe not so typical. One is the, the council and process efficiencies item. Uh, if you're looking at Monday, that's also known as the white paper that we've been working on in the background here, looking at some efficiencies and ways of doing business that we uh, would pre be prepared to bring to you in a white paper format and start a discussion about how our business uh, should look going forward here into the future. A few other large items uh, to highlight for you in September. One is the non troll area management. You'll note that that is broken into two days to help with decision making. Um, and that also means that ground fish is stacked in Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And then uh, highly migratory species matters comes in toward the back end. We also then have marine planning um, that's shaded at this time. There was some talk yesterday, you'll recall, about having that come up uh, in a more frequent basis. And based on your discussions yesterday, we've put that on your agenda, um, although it's still shaded. A couple of other things to consider here. Um, as we uh, talk as staff about what our brave new world looks like, um, as we are trying to come out of COVID, uh, what we're learning here in our March, April, and June uh, meetings and bringing people back together, what we would propose to you in terms of in-person attendance looks a little bit different than what we have had, what we have tried to do here uh, this week. So what we would propose is that uh, when it comes to in-person attendance that we have the council and the ground fish advisory bodies and the highly migratory advisory bodies and that the other advisory bodies be remote. Uh, we'd appreciate any feedback you may have on that. The reason behind that uh, proposal to you all is several fold. Uh, one is concerns our budget, um, issues. Um, you may recall earlier in the week, we discussed our budget and the uh, you know, significant deficit condition we find ourselves in. So that is weighing on us heavily. Um, the other consideration is our ongoing COVID situation. Um, and so coming into this meeting, we did have a desire to bring all of our advisory bodies in person at first. Uh, COVID considerations raised their head. Uh, the SSC requested that they go remote. We allowed that. Um, coming closer to this meeting, we had uh, attendance drop off because of COVID considerations. And so we found ourselves in a position with many advisory bodies having uh, fewer people in person than we were expecting. And there were some challenges in running meetings uh, because of that. So we put all of that together and we would like to be more intentional about the advisory bodies that we do have in person. Um, and we think that those advisory bodies have major items or that need interaction with the council uh, that we would like to bring those to to the council meetings. The other um, advisory bodies uh, could probably function just fine remotely. Um, there has been talk of the hybrid setup. I would just indicate quickly that that is the toughest model to put together. I know a lot of people like to pursue that, but we would propose either remote or in person, but hybrid is a very difficult beast to manage as we are finding. So now I'll turn your attention to the year at a glance summary. Um, I've already walked through September, so I don't feel a need to do that again. Uh, but as you look at this um, across the top here, we do still have a couple of location TBDs. Uh, June, we are looking to uh, come back to this hotel next June. We're uh, eyeing that. It looks like a very realistic possibility. It's not been formalized yet, but um, that's the uh, shaded pencil in location, if you will. For April, um, we are still pinning down a location. Um, there are a couple of possibilities in California. Um, budget conditions are weighing very heavily on us there. Um, California has always been an expensive place. Um, costs are going up and we are seeing that reflected in some of the um, responses to our request for proposal that we sent out to hotels. And so we are looking at um, San Jose, that's quite expensive. We're looking at potentially scaling down a bit 
and looking at places like Roanoke Park and Foster City, which are smaller. We've outgrown them in recent years, but if we scale down, they may become options for us once more. So we're getting close there, but that is still um, an open, open to be determined location for next April. Now, as you look at the agenda items, um, as with anything like this, uh, the meetings that are closer to us are uh, more fully fleshed out and we do have um, some, some filling in to do as we go through the next couple of meetings as we look at March, April and June of next year. Um, as is typical, we do have um, heavy ground fish throughout all of that. Um, and then we do have salmon matters. Um, I think this is all fairly routine. Um, if we do look at a couple of things that you may be considering uh, that are affected by several um, decisions, one is uh, the uh, gear switching matter and the effect there on the trawl catch share program review. We are still proposing to make some headway on the trawl catch share program review. Um, you may recall that NOAA indicated earlier this, this week that they did receive funding for the trawl cost efficiencies project. And so we see that uh, as informing the trawl catch share program review um, and that we would continue to schedule uh, that review um, and the kickoff of it, uh, although we do still have some workload concerns as that starts to ramp up and um, getting through gear switching before we overload some of our staff. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be appropriate for me to pause here um, and see if there are any questions. Happy to answer any of them. Um, and if there are not, I would recommend going to our advisory body reports. All right, thank you. We'll have, obviously we'll have discussion on that later, but let's see if there are any questions. Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify in the supplemental September agenda, you have the EAS and EWG highlighted there is, but what I heard you speak to was the gap in GMT and the HMAS and HMSMT potentially meeting in person. Can you clarify what is meant by the shading on the EAS and EWG there? Um, yes, thank you, Ms. Watson. Um, just a minute here while I catch up and look at some overlapping parts. Maybe I'll look at Mike and see if he has a re an immediate response. Mr. Burner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jessica, for the question. Uh, I shaded that in response to some input I got from our uh, HMS staffer. I believe the intention there, if I can remember correctly, was it's mostly about the timing of that. There might be a, a, an alternate plan where those ecosystem groups meet in advance of the September meeting by webinar. But I think either way, the, the scheduling of that, they would be uh, in a remote situation is what, what Mr. Burden was speaking to earlier. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thank you for the clarification. All right, any further questions before we get started? Mr. Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just what, I'm not sure I totally understand the shade, what, what shading indicates, I'm in particular looking at November, electronic monitoring, trawl catch share program, table fish gear switching, that, that component there being shaded, what what does that, what, what's that telling me? Mr. Burner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No expert on either of those topics, but I'll venture an answer here. Uh, my understanding with electronic monitoring is that depending on the uh, update in September, there may or may not be a need to go forward with ROA and PPA with a, and an FPA if there, if there are not regulatory changes. So, so those are just shaded, uh, waiting to see the outcome of the September update. Uh, be, could very well be uh, off the mark there a little bit. Uh, much, much the same with the uh, sablefish process, kind of depending on uh, how ready we are to, to take that matter up in November rather than uh, a desire to, to necessarily delay that. So that's my understanding of those. Any further questions on the overview? John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This was sort of a follow-up from the question about the EWG EAS shading. Um, 
pointing out, I guess the, the response made sense. There's also the issue there that there are two HMS MT members that are on the EWG as well as council staff that support both. So that item is conflicting. And if, if it's remote for part of it and not remote for the other, it could get very complicated. Thanks for that, John. All right, let's, let's get started on the advisory body's statements and then uh, we'll, we'll take a break. Um, I'd like the break to be determined. So we'll start with the salmon technical team, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be referring to, referring to agenda item C8A STT report on the investigation of effort forecasts produced for areas south of Cape Falcon using the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model. At the April 2022 Council meeting, the STT stated plans to evaluate effort forecast performance and consider ways to improve the accuracy of effort projections produced by the KOHM. Furthermore, the STT stated that they would develop a plan and timeline for addressing the effort forecasting issue and report back to the council at their June 2022 meeting. The STT and MU met on May 24th, 2022 to discuss two topics. One, a report on the work required to investigate the potential for improvements to forecasts of sunk coho ocean salmon exploitation rates. This is to be provided to the council in September. And two, the KOHM effort forecast evaluation. With regards to the KOHM effort forecast, the STT and MU discussed work performed to date, which was focused on evaluating effort forecast performance at the month, management area, and fishery level. In general, forecasted effort tended to be higher than postseason estimates in Northern and Central Oregon commercial fisheries, while effort forecast errors for commercial fisheries in Northern and Central California tended to be more balanced. There was also some evidence of overprediction of effort in Oregon and California recreational fisheries, but the patterns in forecast error tended to vary from month to month within the management area. The STT and MU also discussed the roles of fleet attrition, changes in fish distribution, and year-to-year -year changes in target stock abundances as potential drivers of the patterns observed. Further work will primarily be focused on assessing effort forecast performance if more contemporary effort data per day open uh, were used to make projections. Currently, the KOHM uses data from 1998 through the year prior to the management year to make effort forecasts. The STT will explore using shorter data ranges while continuing to employ existing effort forecasting methods. Similar to recent updates to the data ranges used to project contact rates per unit effort within the KOHM, a change of this nature would not require a formal methodology review. Different data ranges may be considered for different months, areas, or fisheries, and implement, implementation of these data ranges will be dictated by the assessment of forecast performance. The STT plans to meet again and discuss this topic in July or August, and will provide a report detailing progress on this topic at the council or to the council at its September meeting. And that concludes our statement. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Are there any questions of the STT? Thank you very much. We'll hear from the SSC, John DeVore. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. On behalf of the SSC, I'd like to read Agenda Item C8A, Supplemental SSC Report 1. The SSC discussed workload planning and asked the following updates to our April 2022 statement under this agenda item. The seventh national meeting of the Scientific Coordination Subcommittee of the Council Coordination uh, Committee, um, also known as the National SSC meeting, is scheduled for August 15 to 17 in Sitka, Alaska. The meeting will explore fishery management adaptations to a changing climate. Dr. Andre Punt has been invited to be a keynote speaker and other SSC members anticipated to attend include Drs. Kristen Marshall, Melissa Haltuck, 
Teresa So, Galen Johnson, and potentially Owen Hamel. The SSC recommends convening the annual SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee meeting with the uh, uh, California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team to review additions to the Integrated Eco Ecosystem Assessment Report as a webinar on September 16. The SSC also recommends inviting the SSC Salmon Subcommittee, Salmon Technical Team, and Salmon Advisory Subpanel to the September SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee meeting since one of the recommended top topics is specifically relevant to salmon management. The Ecosystem Workgroup and Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel are also invited to this meeting. The SSC Coastal Pelagic Species Subcommittee, uh, well, let me um, actually uh, revise this part of the statement. In subsequent discussions, we talked about uh, having a webinar in, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the, yeah, having a webinar in August to review the uh, CPS stock assessment terms of reference. But in subsequent discussions, um, now uh, the recommendation is that this will just be part of the SSC September agenda, since um, we don't anticipate that'll be uh, a time consuming uh, item. The SSC recommends holding the annual salmon methodology review in late September or late October. A specific date and topics are yet to be determined. The SSC recommends moving forward with the two proposed workshops on Pacific sardine. A Pacific sardine stock structure workshop is proposed for fall of 2022. A Pacific Fishery Management Council sponsored methodology review with the goal of improving estimates of the abundance of the northern subpopulation of Pacific sardine is proposed for the winter of 2023. The CPS subcommittee is willing to participate in these workshops. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee is planning additional meetings and workshops over the next several months. Uh, the first one is the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee plans to hold a workshop June 21 to 23 to develop methods for constructing abundance indices based on hook and line surveys and to review the template model builder implementation of a species distribution model to generate biomass indices. This meeting has been noticed <clears throat> and will be held as a webinar over three days. And I might add that that meeting notice is on our website. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee proposes a planning meeting to be held as a webinar in late July or early August to coordinate aging prioritization to inform the groundfish stock assessments prioritized for review in 2023. This will allow early coordination to provide as much age data as possible. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee will conduct a workshop to be held as a webinar over three to four days in late August to explore approaches to model the effect of large closed areas and other regulation changes in stock assessments. The subcommittee will also discuss catch estimation procedures to inform catch reconstructions for 2023 assessments. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee will review the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's proposed acoustic remotely operated vehicle survey methodology for semi-pelagic rockfish uh, on September 27 to 30 with the participation of a Center of Independent Experts Scientists with expertise on acoustic abundance estimation methods. The SSC recommends combining the review of methods for constructing abundance indices from Washington hook and line surveys to this meeting to reduce the number of meetings. Uh, due to participation by a CIE expert, this is proposed as a hybrid in-person meeting in Portland over three and a half to four days with remote access available for those unable to attend in person. The specific dates are not fixed and are subject to the agenda. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee recommends scheduling a workshop on using ROV data and stock assessments in November or December of 2022. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee previously proposed a workshop to discuss alternative harvest control rules for spiny dogfish to reflect its lower productivity and the findings from the most recent assessment that the SPR 50% harvest rate may not be sustainable. The SSC recommends postponing that workshop until 2024 due to lack of data and capacity to make progress on this topic prior to the 2023 stock assessment cycle. Yeah. 
and I'll just point you to the table um, appended to the uh, report here and um, the correction that I uh, spoke to regarding this CPS terms of reference review is, is uh, row number six. So um, as you just heard that uh, now the SSC is proposing that be a, an agenda item on their September agenda. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, John. Our questions, Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the SSC report, uh, it states that the SSC ground fish subcommittee will be reviewing Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's proposed acoustic ROV survey methodology in September. Uh, can you please clarify if this is just referencing our ODFW nearshore semi-pelagic rockfish acoustic survey or our ROV survey? Because those are two separate methodologies. Right. And um, yeah, we we didn't catch that, but it's it's the acoustic survey that we'll be looking at in, in um, uh, late September. And then later in the year, we'll be looking at the ROV uh, surveys. Thank you. Any further questions on the SSC report? Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Just want to follow up a minute on Jessica's question and just clarify that the November, December ROV workshop then is intended to incorporate um, review of ROV data, both from Oregon and California ROV surveys. Yes, that is correct. Great. Thank you. All right. Anything further for the SSC? All right. Thank you very much, John. We'll now have the ground fish management team report. Welcome back, Katie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Members. Let me get to my, okay. Um, for the record, my name is Katie Pearson and I'll be reading Supplemental Revised GMT Report 1. The ground fish management team reviewed their draft September agenda and the draft year at a glance contained in the advanced briefing book, as well as the status of ongoing product, projects and offers the following for consideration by the Pacific Fishery Management Council. GMT capacity. The GMT reminds the council that we have one vacant seat since January 2021 and requests that the council consider filling that seat. Specifically, the team has been without an economist or social scientist and does feel the lack of expertise in our discussions and statements, uh, particularly on difficult and economically impactful items like gear switching. The reference to lack of capacity is not a new one uh, to the council, but uh, with the increasing number of and complexity of agenda items, but is one that remains important to the team's produ productivity and quality of work. September meeting. Descending device mortality rates. A subgroup of the GMT has been working on developing mortality rates for additional rockfish species when descending devices are used by anglers. The GMT believes that work will be ready for review by the Scientific and Statistical Committee, SSC, in September 2022. Therefore, we request the council add review of this work to the SSC September agenda. The GMT can also provide an update on the work to the council as an informational report under the in-season agenda item in September. Stock definitions. Based on council discussion regarding stock definitions at this meeting, council is not ready at this time to convene a workshop or ad hoc work group. Instead, it is the GMT's understanding that the council will initiate the process using a small group of, of advisors that will include state, tribal, and national marine fishery service staff. It is our understanding that this small group will meet between now and September council meeting with the aim of preparing a purpose and needs statement to present at this September meeting. The GMT notes that council decision-making on this item will be necessary for certain stocks being assessed in 2023. The assessors have indicated the need for the council guidance on areas for stock status determination at November 20 at the November 2022 council meeting. The GMT recommends the council add the stock definitions item to the September council meeting agenda, but the GMT is unclear whether it should be categorized as scoping or something else. 
The GMT notes that the September council meeting is only scheduled for a total of 36.8 hours compared to 45.3 hours at this June meeting. And there appears to be room to add at least one other ground fish item, such as stock definitions. September agenda. The draft September agenda only has the GMT scheduled to meet through Sunday, September 11th, but there are ground fish agenda items on the council's agenda on Tuesday, September 13th. Additionally, there are ecosystem agenda items and administrative agenda items, future council operations scheduled for Tuesday, September 13th, in which the GMT will have an interest in participating. Therefore, the GMT schedules may warrant reconsideration to ensure we have adequate time to discuss and write reports, as well as be available when agenda items are in the front of the council. Of the agenda items scheduled by the council for September, the GMT requests guidance of which items the GMT should prioritize, i.e., which of the seven to nine groundfish items, along with the two Pacific halibut items, one ecosystem item, and three, three to four administrative items on the draft September agenda should be prioritized for the team. GMT year at a glance. The GMT also reminds the council that our groundfish workload in recent council meetings has reached or exceeded the team's capacity. And our workload often includes tracking other non-groundfish items that does not always result in submitting a report. The GMT reviewed the council YAG and has some, had had some discussion about the items in table one below, acknowledging the many factors that many factors and pieces can change between meetings, especially several meetings ahead. The GMT has tried to place items on the list while primarily focusing on GMT items, but want to note that there are many items that the team tracks that are above and beyond groundfish items. For example, marine planning or ecosystem. The team would also like to mention, nope, the team would also like to make the council aware of our duties outside of council meetings. GMT members will be required to participate in the 2023 star panels, as well as multiple council related workshops this year and next. Star panels result in substantial workload for the team as they require input, participation, and attendance. Further, the SSC is holding five works is also holding five workshops throughout the remainder of the year, which GMT members expect to participate in. Dates for most of these workshops are unconfirmed at this time, but are planned for June, July, August, September, and November or December. Additionally, depending on potential stock definitions agenda item in September, the GMT may need to con convene an overwinter meeting. It is also possible that the GMT will have to convene a spring meeting to front load items like gear switching and non trawl area modifications. Given the potential forthcoming workload for this year and next, the team is concerned about the GMT's ability to accomplish all of the council's goals while continuing to provide the quality of work the council has come to expect. Thus, the team requests specific guidance from the council on prioritization of our workload for each meeting. Table one is the GMT YAG from the GMT Groundfish item perspective. Um, I won't go through this whole thing, but what I will note is that for September 2022, um, electric moni electronic monitoring update, trawl catch share program and intersector allocation review and scoping, non-trawl area management, ROA and PPA, and stock assessment plan um, final all, are all bolded and italicized items that are those GMT items that uh, we recommend unshading on the council YAG. We also recommend uh, adding stock definitions as already mentioned. Um, in November, 2022, uh, we recommend unshading electronic monitoring, assessment methodology review and approval, uh, trawl catch share program and intersector allocation review update, stable fish gear switching PPA. In March, 2023, we recommend unshading electronic, electronic monitoring FPA and then adding stock definitions and then non trawl area management FPA. In April, 2023, we recommend unshading stable fish gear switching FPA um, and taking and keeping uh, the trawl catch share program and intersector allocation as shaded and moving that to June, 2023. Um, so moving that item to June, as well as adding a stock definitions item. 
multiple years at a glance, is becoming apparent to the GMT that there is a need to consider potentially scheduling agenda items using the multi-year approach, especially given that some groundfish items, example, program reviews, are a reoccurring requirement that should be accounted for when thinking about the ability of the team to take up other actions. The GMP is sensitive to the items on the workload prioritization list, capacity of analysis, and Magston Stevens Act's mandates, such as program reviews. Uh, current heavy workload items, nope, current heavy workload topics include the ongoing gear switching item, preliminary preferred alternative PPA in November 2022, the new stock de de definitions item, potentially some form of progress in September 2022, the trawl catch share program review and intersector allocation, scoping to start September 2022 based on the YAG, and the non-trawl area management package, ROA PPA September 2022 on the YAG. Each of these items are expected to continue into, if not through, 2023. Above, the GMT has attempted to schedule stock definitions and the final preferred alternative FPA for the non-trawl area management pack package, which are currently not placed on the YAG. The GMT encourages the council to be mindful that these items are set to run concurrently, relying on the same analysts. During the gear switching discussion under agenda item F5 at this meeting, Dr. Jim Seeger indicated that if gear switching does not stay on the timeline that is on the YAG, the trawl catch share program review will be pushed further back. This will have a cascading effect on other groundfish items in the future and potentially delay other items from being finalized, as well as new management measures from being prioritized. Similarly, in addition to significant workload associated with the stock definitions item noted in the GMT statement, um, agenda item F4, supplemental GMT report one, June 2022, there's uncertainty regarding how this item may affect prioritization, prioritiz pr prioritizing or scheduling other related items. The GMT reiterates the need for some current agenda items to be finalized before prioritizing other items given analyst workload limitations. Therefore, the team suggests that, that the next workload prioritization and new management measures priorities item be moved to June 2023, which will hopefully allow the council to take final action on already agendized items. FPA for gear switching is currently scheduled for April 2023 before new items are prioritized. The GMT is mindful that there are many items on the workload prioritization list that have not been prioritized and there is support for those items to be undertaken. However, work on those items cannot be accomplished until finalization of other groundfish items reduces GMT and council staff workload. Therefore, the GMT urges the council to stay on track for current items so that other items can be considered for prioritization in the, next, in the near future. Using the package that came out of LEFG review as an example of another complex agenda item that has the potential to be prioritized in the future, if the council were to prioritize that in June, then the whole package would be prioritized. This package includes allowance for slinky pots, permit price reporting, cost recovery, allowing a fourth tier permit on a vessel, taking multiple cumulative landings for each LEFG permit and the removal of the base permit. These items vary in the workload required, but the GMT anticipates that scoping could happen in September 2023, as long as items such as gear switching have been finalized, which would then move these items through the 2024 and possibly 2025 year. There are, of course, many other items in the workload prioritization list, and the GMT does not intend this example to indicate a GMT priority, but only reminds the council that in order to stay within team capacity, items must come off the list before new items are prioritized. And that ends my rather lengthy, lengthy statement. I'll take any questions. All right, thank you, Katie. Are there any questions on the GMT statement? Heather Hall. Thank you, Katie, and thank you to the GMT for your comprehensive um, look at um, meeting planning. We appreciate it. Um, I did have a question on your comment about the September council meeting, your comment in the GMT report, and wondered, I realized this is this um, supplemental attachment four has just came out with the updated um, schedule and, and was just wanting to see if the GMT meeting on Monday, September 12th, which is an extra day compared to the um, 
other um, QR agenda, if that works for the GMT, if you think that um, will get you where you need to be. Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Hall, for the question. Um, I do think it has improved um, the GMT um, schedule. Um, I do think there is still that concern about um, other items that may be on day last or some of the administrative items that the GMT does um, have interest in um, participating in. But I do think that this current um, September schedule is uh, addresses some of those needs. Thank you. Further questions of the GMT? Thank you very much, Katie. Well, we've been at this for about two hours, and I think that's pr pretty much our limit until we take a break. So um, let's take a break here. Um, let me see if 15 minutes is going to be enough for folks. Or Okay, so we'll take a 15-minute break here. That'll give folks a chance to run up and do any last-minute packing. And then we'll come back. And if we do need, if we're going to go well, if it looks like we're encroaching on noon, we'll take another break. I don't think we will, but just to make sure people have a chance to check out. So we'll be back at nine at uh, ten fifteen.
All right, we're going to get started here in a minute. So um, give folks a chance to get that last cup of coffee and grab a seat. All right, we'll um, get started here. <clears throat> we'll hear next from uh, the Marine Planning Committee, and that will be followed by the GAP. And I understand Susan Chambers will be giving both reports. So um, let me welcome Susan. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council members. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Susan Chambers, and I will be reading the Marine Planning Committee report and the GAP report. <clears throat> we'll take those one at a time. So, right, right. Questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with the starting with the Marine Planning Committee report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning, the <clears throat> the Marine Planning Committee notes that the Marine Planning is next on the council's agenda in November, 2022. The Marine Planning Committee recommends scheduling a two hour September Marine Planning agenda item based on one, a lease auction for California wind energy sites is scheduled to happen this fall. September would likely be the last opportunity for the council to discuss and comment on the topic in open session. Number two, the volume and fast pace of offshore wind activities means that several important issues would not be discussed in open council session until November. <clears throat> and three, multiple comment letters would have to be developed via the council's quick response procedure. While the quick response process has generally worked as designed, it precludes full public transparent consideration of any particular issue and the council's proposed comments. <clears throat> And just as a note here, this was uh, developed prior to the council's discussion yesterday. So moving on, uh, related to council meeting agendas and future workload planning, the MPC has explored different approaches regarding timing and duration for its meetings. Given the substantial workload, the MPC may consider one, <clears throat> longer standalone meetings of one to three days as needed in advance of council meetings, two, shorter, more frequent meetings, or three, establishing monthly virtual meetings, or four, some combination of these. So far, the committee has not met in conjunction with a council meeting because it would create many scheduling conflicts. The MPC would appreciate council input on future MPC meeting planning. In addition, the committee suggests the council schedule a standing marine planning agenda item for every meeting. The numerous issues, comment letters, and meetings require a substantial amount of time and focus from the committee and council staff. And the MPC appreciates council guidance as we continue to navigate the new reality of offshore wind energy and aquaculture development on the Pacific Coast. <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes our statement. Happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Susan. Are there any questions of the MPC on its report? Uh, I'm not seeing any. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I'm, this is Karen. I'm having trouble raising my hand. Okay. Uh, but I do have a question for Susan, um, if that's okay. Yeah, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so uh, Susan, thank you for the report um, and to the MPC committee. I just wanted to ask the question, 
whether um, yesterday's council discussion um, addressed some of the feedback that you were um, looking for as a committee and and whether you other than agendizing this topic every meeting that's not hasn't been decided yet but the other aspects of the guidance you were looking for did did our discussion and motions yesterday cover uh, what you were looking for uh, mr. chair dr. Brady yes I think so um, you know we really needed some of that guidance and that will help us better focus our attention and um, you know it's and I think moving forward, you know, the, uh, the agenda items could be informational. And I think you guys talked about this yesterday as well. Um, an informational update um, showing what we have done, what's coming up, you know, things of that nature will provide the council and the public with the pertinent information we have to review and what is coming forward. So, and that is part of what the Marine Planning Committee was created for. So I think, I think everything yesterday it was really well thought out and should work for us. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions of Susan? I'm not seeing any hands, but I have a question for you, Susan. Um, is there any reason to expect the September agenda item to take a different amount of time than we spent at this meeting on marine planning? Mr. Gorelnik, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think it could be shorter, um, especially if we do an informational update. Um, you know, that may be something that council staff would want to work with uh, our MPC staff officer, Mr. Kerry Griffin on. Um, we do have several things to discuss. Um, the proposed sale notice is probably the biggest one, uh, but because I expect the deadline for those letters to not overlap with the council process, um, you know, that it probably wouldn't uh, contribute to the council discussion, or that is the advisory bodies probably would not have time to discuss that and open uh, council session. So um, September could conceivably be just an informational update and not take as long as it did this time. Does that answer your question? Right. Thank you, Susan. Any other questions? And not seeing any hands, would you please uh, move forward with the gap report? Yes, thank you very much. I just have to find it on my computer. Here we go. Whoops, I lost it. Okay, uh, moving ahead with our gap report. It's a little bit longer. Um, the ground fish advisory panel resumed, re <laughs> I can't even talk today, reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments and recommendations. Overarching comments. The gap appreciates the ability to use the hybrid approach that is both in-person and virtual at this meeting. And we thank Mr. Brett Weedoff, Mr. Chris Kleinschmidt, and Mr. Craig Hess for their dedication to making the technology work. The process went as smoothly as possible and afforded good gap participation. However, no process is perfect. COVID-19 has forced the PFMC and the public to rethink the way we interact. For example, at this meeting, a number of gap members would not have been able to attend were it not for the virtual option. Similarly, other gap members other members of the GAP find negotiating an online presence and fully participating in GAP discussion difficult. <clears throat> Similar to our thoughts laid out in our supplemental GAP report one in April, the GAP would prefer to meet in person but recognizes that sometimes absences cannot be avoided and alternates may be unavailable, especially with a group that has 21 members. We discussed the possibility of holding some GAP meetings completely virtual March, for example, when the ground fish workload is particularly low, enabling the council's other advisory bodies to take advantage of a hybrid option. It may be worthwhile to consider this rotating hybrid approach to advisory body meetings as the council considers C.2 future council operations in September. Regarding the September draft agenda, the gap suggests the following. 
One, unshade G5, the Nontral Area Management Agenda Item. The GAP understands the analysis on this item will be completed and ready for discussion in September. Given this item's high level of importance to the non-trawl fleet, especially in California, the GAP supports scheduling this in September. Further, we suggest a pre-council work session discussed below. Number two, stock definitions and stock assessments. Given the council's floor discussion on these items earlier this week, the GAP supports adding these items to the agenda for September. Number three, Unshade the G6 electronic monitoring update. The GAP supports scheduling this in September as the next step in the process is likely to revolve around how best to implement electronic monitoring. Number four, <clears throat> Unshade G4, the trawl catch shares program and intersector allocation. This could be a short agenda item with simple updates from council staff and GAP input on the best process to move forward. Delaying this until November, until the November meeting may result in a high workload for council staff since it might overlap with the Sable Fish gear switching agenda item. Lastly, number five, September meeting descending device mortality rates. We agree with the GMT on this in that a subgroup of the groundfish management team has been working on developing mortality rates for additional rockfish species when the descending devices are used by anglers. The GMT believes that work will be ready for review by the Scientific and Statistical Committee in September. Therefore, we also request the Council add review of this work to the SSC September agenda. The GMT can also provide an update on that work to the Council as an informational update under the in-season agenda item in September. Regarding the draft year at a glance, the GAP suggests scheduling the non troll area management item for FPA in March or April 2023 for the reasons stated above. Uh, let's see. Additionally, the GAP agrees with the Supplemental Marine Planning Committee report that a marine planning agenda item be scheduled at every council meeting. Frequently, the deadlines for comment letters and other responses are out of sync with council meetings and the council has had to rely on a quick response system to approve letters to agencies, typically unrelated to the council management process. This has worked in the past, but in the interest of full transparency, it would be best for the council to review as many of these letters and comments as possible in full public view. <clears throat> the sheer volume of new issues, primarily from other state and federal agencies, that could affect council, man council managed fisheries is almost overwhelming allowing the MPC to vet these issues and meetings, summarize them, draft the necessary communications and bring forward the most important ones for council consideration will serve the council, fisheries, stakeholders and the public. <clears throat> Regarding non-council agenda workshops and work sessions, the GAP supports the SSC's recommendation to schedule various workshops as identified in the SSC report and supported in agenda item F.3.A, Supplemental Gap Report 1. The proposed webinar in August, exploring approaches to model the effect of large, large closed areas and other regulation changes in stock assessments, seems particularly beneficial in light of the expected NIMS and council staffing changes. We also reiterate our support for an ad hoc work group on groundfish stock definitions and gap representation on that work group, as noted in our agenda item F.4.A, Supplemental Gap Report 1. Lastly, the gap also notes it would be beneficial for the gap to convene an online, online work session in late August or early, early September before the September Council meeting, solely fo focused on the non troll area management agenda item. Council staff noted this issue will heavily rely on a lot of charts and layers of data and will feature online mapping capability. An online work session would allow a greater number of fishermen and other stakeholders to view the data and communicate with their GAP representatives so GAP members can move forward in September with the best information available. And Mr. Chair, that concludes our GAP statement and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Susan. Are there questions on the GAP report? All right, thank you, Susan.
We'll now hear from the CPS MT, Kirk Lynn. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council members, good morning. I'll be reading from agenda item CAA, Supplemental CPS MT Report 1. The Coastal Plastic Species Management Team reviewed the draft proposed council meeting agenda September 2022, Attachment 2, and the Pacific Council Workload Planning Preliminary Year to Glance Summary in Attachment 1. The CPSMT offers the following for council consideration. Fall CPSMT meetings. The CPSMT plans to meet in the fall to discuss fishery management plan housekeeping changes in preparation for the November 2022 agenda item and other CPSMT items for the upcoming year. The CPSMT requests this be a hybrid meeting to allow for full CPSMT participation. The CPSMT will also have a remote meeting prior to the September Council to discuss ecosystem initiatives and other topics as needed. Essential fish habitat. Per the Council's discussion under Agenda D3 at this meeting, the CPSMT will meet with the Habitat Committee at the November 2022 Council meeting to discuss EFH Phase 2. The CPSMT will provide an update to the Council on progress and timeline through the future council meeting agenda and workload planning agenda item at that meeting. Sardine workshops. The CPSMT prefers in-person participation for the two proposed Pacific Sardine workshops in Supplemental NIMS Report 1. Given the relevance and importance to the CPSMT's work, we request as many CPSMT members as possible be able to attend and participate in these workshops. Future meeting format. The CPSMT found that the return to an in-person meeting format in June with various COVID protocols worked reasonably well and favors continuing the in-person format for future council meetings. However, some CPSMT members were not able to attend and the team sees benefits to also having remote attendance options available for advisory bodies. And that concludes our report. Thank you very much, Kirk, for the report. Let's see if there are any questions of the management team. All right, thank you very much, Kirk. Uh, we'll now hear from the HMS AS, and I think Kit Dahl will be reading that report. So we'll welcome Kit to the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. On behalf of the HMS advisory subpanel, I will read their brief report under this agenda item. The HMSAS enjoyed the benefit of holding a virtual meeting in advance of this council meeting. Given the number of HMS items on the draft proposed council meeting agenda for September 2022, we would like to request the council support an online HMSAS meeting to be held on or about August 31st. We would also like to inform the council of a possible conflict with the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission Northern Committee meeting. Before the COVID pandemic, the NC typically met in early September. At the time of this statement is being written, NC 18 has not yet been scheduled. And I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Kit, are there any questions on the AS report? Thank you, Kit. And now we'll hear from the HMS management team, Amber Rhodes. Good Welcome. morning, Council Chair. Can you hear me? You bet. Okay. Council Chair, Council Members, I'm Amber Rhodes. I'll be reading the HMSMT supplemental report. One under this agenda topic. The HMS MT reviewed the draft September agenda and year at a glance. These were the uh, not the most recent ones that are now in the briefing book. Uh, we offer the following comments and recommendations for council consideration. Regarding the September agenda, I'm focusing in here on the swordfish management and monitoring plan. The MT is concerned about having sufficient time to complete the outstanding task associated with the SMMP agenda item that the council requested in 2019. Based on discussions during this meeting, the MT understands that completing the hard caps analysis to support council adoption of a preferred alternative in November is a priority. 
Therefore, the HMSMT proposes for the council to schedule an SMMP agenda item after the November 2022 meeting for the HMSMT to report to the council on the outstanding SMMP task. Regarding the November agenda, I'm going to focus on Drift Gilnet bycatch performance review. Like with the SMMP, the HMSMT is concerned about combined combining this workload with the hard caps workload and recommends postponing drift gillnet bycatch performance review until after the November 2022 meeting. The MT discussed that this agenda item is typically scheduled for June meetings based on fishery data availability and related processes to estimate total drift gillnet fishery bycatch. Further, there's a two year time lag between the terminal year of the fishery information considered and the council's review of fishery performance. Therefore, if the council is interested in the drift gill net bycatch performance review to include data through 2021, they could schedule this agenda item for June 2023. Now focusing on EFH. The HMSMT requests the council to unshade and retitle the phase two report as a phase two update for the November meeting. I'll caveat here that we were unaware uh, that, the, that the CPSMT would also be requesting uh, an update at the same time. National Marine Fisheries Service and the council recently received funding to carry out phase two uh, EFH review for HMS. As a result, the MT is working with Council, NIMS West Coast Region, Southwest Fishery Science Center staff to move forward with the HMS EFH review and per the phase two action plan adopted in March 2021 by the Council. The MT can provide an update on progress and recommendations for further council consideration of EFH review work at future meetings and would expect to take into account coordination with subject matter experts involved in the coastal pelagic species EFH review. I'll focus on hard caps next. Given that the MT has yet to complete an analysis of the council's range of alternatives on hard caps, the MT requests reflecting the November agenda item as a preliminary preferred alternative slash final preferred alternative. A substantial amount of work remains to carry out the Council's direction to address the deficiencies identified in the original proposal and described in a June 9, 2017 letter to the Council. The link uh, to that is, is attached in the report. Given that the MT anticipates careful consideration of whether the analysis and supporting documentation is sufficient for taking final action during the November meeting and whether adoption of a PPA would be more prudent at that time. Finally, notwithstanding council guidance at this meeting, the MT anticipates the need for additional meeting time between now and the September meeting, and again before the November council meeting. The MT believes they can accomplish much of this work virtually, but requests council support for at least one in-person meeting between now and the November council meeting. <clears throat> and that concludes my report, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Amber. Are there questions of Amber on the MT report? Uh, we have an online question from John Uritz. John. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Ms. Rhodes, for the report. A uh, question regarding the swordfish monitoring and management plan statement. The team mentions outstanding SMMP tasks from 2019. Could you briefly explain what those outstanding tasks are? Thank you, Mr. Uger. It's through the chair. I uh, have pulled those up here. So there were three outstanding tasks. Task one was to analyze effort, catch, and bycatch in subsets of Hawaii shallow set longline observer data for potential action area delineations. Task two was to document all sources of swordfish supply to the U.S. West Coast, including both foreign and domestic. 
um, for West Coast and Hawaii cod. And then task three was to estimate related conservation impacts to characterize the relationship between domestic and foreign sources of swordfish supply and the potential to mitigate conservation impacts and reduce the nation's seafood trade deficit through increased West Coast production. And those are the three tasks that were requested in 2019. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Sorry, yes, it did. All right. Further questions on the MT report? All right, thank you very much, Amber. Uh, that completes all the reports on my list and takes us to public comment. There are two public comments, uh, Teresa Labriola, followed by Jeff Shester. Welcome, Teresa. Oh, good morning. Um, good morning, Chair Gorelnik and members of the council. I'm Teresa Labriola, I represent Wild Oceans. And thank you for the opportunity to make a couple of short comments today on future meeting planning. Um, first, regarding ecosystems, um, in March, uh, we concluded a several year project of the Climate and Communities Initiative. And there was a very robust discussion of options for a new initiative um, between the council and, and the work groups, um, including taking initial actions to implement the council's Climate and Communities Initiative. Uh, the council showed strong support in March uh, for, and, and they encouraged the EWG to further develop the Ecosystem Initiatives 2.1 and 2.8, and to bring them back to the Council in September. Um, not just as a cut and paste, but the Council asked the team to put some additional thought into these initiative descriptions so the Council could have a very strong foundation and discussion in September. And so I'm really looking forward to the Council moving forward and selecting a new Ecosystem Initiative in September. And I would ask you to clarify that selecting a new initiative and schedule is included in the, in the agenda item marked FEP initiative update and final adoption of initiatives appendix. Um, Wild Oceans has been a very vocal advocate of ecosystem-based fisheries management for many years. And to this end, we've participated in the development of the fishery ecosystem plan in the Pacific and, and several of the plans in the Atlantic. And I look forward to continuing to work with the EWG and the EAS to further develop a new initiative, including a schedule and roles and responsibilities. I always appreciate their willingness to listen to and consider public comment, and I plan to attend those meetings, either virtually or in person, um, as the council decides. Regarding HMS, um, nearly seven years ago, the council voted to add hard caps to the management of the drift gill net fishery as a conservation backstop. And the hard caps were vacated by court order, as we all know. And last June, the council adopted a revised purpose and need statement for the implementation of hard caps and a range of alternatives. Uh, those, those alternatives included the 20, the initial, the hard caps that were adopted in 2015, as well as um, some other sub options, including uh, individual and fleet wide closures. Um, in the past few years, the fishery has, has changed. Um, the past few years, the, well, we, we've seen the buyout from the, the California buyout program. There were only seven fishermen who fished last year. Um, the fishery has shifted and targeted bluefin tuna, and they've also caught two humpback whales. Um, these changing activities, or maybe changing ocean conditions, it, it demonstrates that the council has a role to play in reducing bycatch in the drift gill net fisheries still, even with a small fleet. Um, over the many years, you've seen overwhelming public support for hard caps from the conservation community and the recreational community. And given this, I request the council direct the team to focus on finalizing this item for November. Um, the team report stated there are, have a lot of obligations and, and, and they're concerned about uh, completing this. Um, I'd support a postponement of other agenda items including some that, that we've fought for over the years, like performance metrics um, and some work under the Swordfish Management and Monitoring Plan in order to afford the team the time needed to complete their analysis. 
Um, I don't support, however, changing the November agenda item back to a PPA, FPA. Um, I think by maintaining it as an FPA, you're maintaining your commitment to this. And if if you are not prepared to um, collect an FPA in November, I, I don't think that demands that you do just because it says final preferred alternative. But I'd like to, you to keep your intentions clear on that. Um, having said this, um, I think the council could have a meaningful discussion about the future of swordfish management or more broadly, highly migratory species management in September without um, the tasks that, that Amber just outlined that were, were, were um, given to the team in 2019. September could provide an opportunity to scope a workshop for the future management of swordfish and other HMS fisheries, including a discussion of uh, fishing performance metrics that I've often pushed for. Um, there's no dispute that I think all of us would like to see uh, increased sustainably caught West Coast swordfish and HMS, and I would um, welcome that discussion. And finally, a brief comment on council operations. I very much appreciate this continued opportunity to provide comments to you remotely. Um, Wild Oceans is a very small organization with a very limited budget and remote participation helps us to actively engage and represent our membership of conservation-minded recreational fishermen. And just wanna thank you for this again. Um, I also really appreciated the gaps uh, statement today um, of the positives and the challenges of hybrid meetings. Um, I'm usually a very active participant in advisory bodies, including CPS, HMS, and ecosystems. Um, the remote meetings that were held for the past two years really allowed me to participate or simply listen to deliberations about issues of high importance to my constituents. And I would appreciate the opportunity to continue to participate in meetings remotely if there was an opportunity, as the GAP said, to let other uh, management teams or advisory bodies have a remote um, or hybrid option. So. Um, I look forward to providing the council feedback in September on your agenda marked council and process efficiencies and um, encourage the council to really consider how to best gather productive feedback from your advisor bodies and management teams and the public in order to um, lay a new path for, for moving forward with um, uh, the council in a, in a brave new world. So thank you so much. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Teresa. Are there any questions for Teresa? Teresa on her public comment. Thank you, Teresa. And now uh, Jeff Shester, Oceana, our last public comment of the June meeting. Welcome, Jeff. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Gorelnik. I, I'm, I'm uh, proud to have that honor at this meeting. Um, thank you all for a, um, a productive meeting. Um, this is Jeff Shester representing Oceana. Um, as far as uh, Future agenda, uh, what, just an overarching comment that we we believe it is uh, very important to have to continue to have a hybrid option, uh, not only for the council meeting on the floor itself, but also for all the advisory bodies to allow for remote listening and public comment. Uh, unfortunately, uh, despite I think uh, a lot of our optimism, uh, we're unfortunately still in a situation with COVID where it, it does pose serious and real health risks. Uh, I personally uh, chose not to come to the meeting this time due to uh, several family members of mine that, that did have COVID and not wanting to put others at risk at this meeting. Um, public participation, uh, given the ongoing COVID situation, we realized it is costly and, and does require uh, staff workload to set that up, but we believe it, it's worth it and because public participation is a fundamental pillar of the council process and should be the utmost priority. Um, and I did want to thank the staff and, and, and the council for the, all the public participation and remote options that were provided to this meeting, so thank you for that. Um, with respect to uh, the future agenda, uh, I'll just go through by sort of topic area or FMP area. Uh, so for groundfish, we first wanted to, to thank the council for all its work on the 2023-24 specifications. Uh, we did want to acknowledge and thank the council for including the incidental catch trigger for short belly rockfish. Uh, this does uh, address our concerns largely with increased potential incidental catch. However, we do continue to see value 
in prohibiting a directed fishery for short belly rockfish in the groundfish FMP. Uh, this item uh, was uh, included in the Council's March uh, discussion and list of groundfish workload priority items for the coming years as a standalone FMP amendment. And uh, we believe uh, you know, our, our organization is ready to help participate and, and work collaboratively with industry to figure out a solution uh, that could work around the table. Uh, and and, and re restore that uh, council policy to the fishery management plan of prohibiting directed fishing for short belly rockfish. So we ask you add that to the future workload. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to uh, note that the non-trawl RCA item is a priority. We are very excited to move forward uh, with the CDFW proposal regarding protecting certain areas within the CalCOD conservation area, along with uh, wholesale removal of the conserva CalCOD conservation area itself. Uh, we think there's a, a really important win-win here, and uh, we ask that the council prioritize uh, getting this agenda item forward, uh, as well as uh, looking at some of the other areas outside the CCA as well throughout the coast. Um, on highly migratory species, uh, we we want to just be very clear that uh, hard caps final action in November uh, we believe should be the top priority, and we ask the council to ensure that the HMS management team uh, is appropriately prioritized and directed to to complete analysis uh, to ensure that final action by November on hard caps uh, will happen. Uh, we uh, along with this, we um, we we believe it is okay to. Uh, for the purpose of finishing hard caps to postpone the drift gill net five catch performance standards to June of 2023 as recommended by the management team. Um, and we hope to see this include both new estimates from the regression tree analysis, uh, as well as the most recent observer data summary from the upcoming 22-23 uh, fishing season. Uh, with respect to the swordfish monitoring and management plan, um, he hearing uh, the, the outstanding three tasks, I guess, reiterated again, uh, we see little benefit in those uh, to the management of HMS. Uh, these are focusing on, on pelagic longline and, and, and talking about more about the transfer effect. These, these items should not be a priority. The priority should be focusing on building a sustainable deep set buoy gear fishery and focusing on innovations in that fishery um, as per the EFPs that were discussed earlier. Uh, if there is any discussion of the swordfish monitoring and management plan and that agenda item continues, we suggest it change focus to focus on phasing out the federal drift gill net permits and adding 100% observer coverage to drift gill nets. Uh, we would support a discussion in this item of NIMS requirements under the Magnus and Stevens Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act to require swordfish imports meet U.S. standards. Uh, we, we believe that that would be could be a useful uh, way to address the con any concerns over swordfish imports, uh, but not uh, the, the tasks as they were laid out by the by the management team. Um, and uh, a phase two update on EFH uh, for HMS species in November sounds right as well. Uh, on, and lastly, on coastal pelagic species, we do not support uh, the CPS uh, management team's recommendation to move forward with a strictly, quote, housekeeping amendment that would not include substantive items. Uh, we, we suggest and ask that the and continue to see the need for a CPS FMP amendment to implement the new anchovy framework that was adopted in Council Operating Procedure 9. So if there is a, a CPS FMP amendment, we, uh, we feel strongly that that should be within the scope and, and it would not be, it would not be a, a wise use of resources to just focus again on, on housekeeping items that are not substantive. Uh, and as we've stated uh, earlier this meeting, we believe that updating the MSY exploitation rate or EMSY for both anchovy and sardines remains a top priority given the high level of uncertainty expressed by the SSC and the management teams about that parameter uh, in the context of both species. Uh, so thank you very much again for a productive council meeting and for all your work given the challenges and um, we look forward to uh, participating in the future and, uh, and thank you uh, again for all your, all your efforts. All right, thank you very much, Jeff, for your public comment. And let me see if there are any questions around the table for you. Thank you, Jeff. So that concludes uh, public comment. We've had all of our reports. It takes us to council action here. And um, 
oftentimes I just turn this over to, to our executive director uh, to, to go through the both the year at the glance and the September agenda. So I think I'm inclined to do that here, if that's okay with you. Oh yes, happy to Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, well, let's see, let's start with the bigger picture here with the year at a glance. Um, recap what we have coming up um, first in September. So there's a variety of groundfish items, many of which are shaded. Um, there was uh, some public comment and some questions about several of these items. Um, questions, for instance, regarding non-trawl area management and the workload associated with that. Questions regarding the trawl catch share program review and uh, having back-to-back -back meetings from September to November on that matter, as well as the amount of time that would be spent on that, uh, that matter in September. Stock definitions, uh, update and scoping, uh, is something that we've talked about this week and that has made its way onto the September uh, stock assessment plan final. I covered that earlier uh, this morning. We have a couple of other additional items that are new. Uh, the Western Regional Action Plan on climate. Um, that's something that was in your informational reports this week. And that uh, in communications with the Science Center, they've indicated they'd be happy to take comments from us uh, following our September meeting. So that's been added. We did strike the recusal policy final. Uh, I understand from general counsel that that is likely to take a year to come back and uh, talk about the recusal policy handbook that is under development. So we'll be looking to put that uh, um, several months out. Uh, have not identified a month just yet, but that's been struck. And we've added the marine planning update uh, as a shaded item in September. A lot of this overlaps then with how we proceed throughout the next few meetings. Um, I've already touched on some of those with regards to uh, ground fish, but starting at the top at CPS, uh, we do have methodology review, which is shaded um, going through ground fish. We do have, um, uh, let's see, shaded items, back-to-back -back meetings here on electronic monitoring, um, back-to-back -back meetings on the trawl catch share program review. We have the sable fish gear switching PPA. I would note there was some talk in the uh, gap report about pushing the trawl catch share program review from November into March. I believe that was the gap report anyway. Moving down to HMS, um, several items here. Uh, there's been some talk um, in our team reports, one about the swordfish management and monitoring plan and concerns over timing, time availability for that workload while we are doing the drift gill net hard cap analysis. So that some talk about moving that from September. Looking at November, we then have the drift gill net hard caps uh, FPA scheduled. Uh, we spent some time talking about that this week. And then moving down through um, salmon, we have methodology review, preseason management schedule, Pacific halibut. We do have the matter of uh, management moving over to the region more formally, and those those discussions would be taking place back to back from September to November. And then we again have a marine planning update if you go all the way to the bottom. In March, we start to have um, a blank space to fill out. Uh, of course, March is a big salmon uh, agenda item several issues on uh, ground fish. We're aiming, for instance, for an electronic monitoring FPA, although that is shaded. Uh, in March, of course, is there a, an important whiting meeting. Um, let's see, and we, as we look out, we see a few more things, uh, continuing to look at the trawl catch share program. We have some EFH on CPS scheduled. Uh, I would also note that there was talk in the HMS management team about EFH there as well, and uh, some available funding that um, I was unaware of until recently has made its way to the region, evidently, although I'd look to Ryan to verify that. Um, and let's see, I will stop there with the year at a glance. Looking at the September meeting more specifically, uh, there are a few things I've made note of uh, as we've gone through uh, management team um, and advisory sub-panel uh, presentations, or uh, um, sorry, losing my words here this morning, uh, reports. Um, so uh, let's see, a few matters. So we would start off um, Thursday with several um, advisory bodies meeting. Um, we've been envisioning, as I said earlier, that we would uh, have the ground fish advisory bodies in person and the highly migratory advisory bodies in person. 
uh, several of those in addition to the, those two, uh, those two uh, ground fish and two highly migratory bodies, we would start with the Habitat Committee, the SDT, the SSC, Budget Committee, um, and so forth. Things are fairly typical. Starting off the formal session of the, the council in September, uh, we go through relatively routine items, closed session, uh, call to order, et cetera. We do have uh, starting um, at C1, um, a matter that is um, uh, research and data needs. This is something we've had a contractor working on in the background here over the last few months, and we would be prepared to bring forward that issue, which concerns um, a new database and um, familiarizing everybody with, with that. We have several salmon matters, um, and again, the Pacific halibut matter as we're um, considering transition of management of that fishery formally from the IPHC over to the region. And then on Saturday, as we go through ground fish, um, several issues here. One is workload and new management measures update, which is something that uh, is routinely scheduled for September. Electronic monitoring, fishery impact review methodology, and then uh, stock definitions update and further scoping. As I indicated earlier, uh, the Science Center is prepared to uh, come back and have a report to update us all on how things are going with, um, I'm sorry, that's stock definitions, not stock assessments. Uh, stock definitions is a matter that we spent uh, some time debating here earlier this week and um, outlining a, a pathway forward. And um, at that time, we, uh, you all asked that this be brought back in September so we could keep making headway on what exactly it is we're dealing with here, um, having some work done in the background over the summer uh, between council staff, NIMP staff, state agency staff, and trying to uh, clarify a way forward. That's how I interpreted that. So that's been uh, put on the agenda for Saturday. On Sunday, uh, we start the first of non-trawl area management, range of alternatives, and a PPA. Uh, that comes back on Monday, uh, with the idea being that that breakup of uh, the, the agenda item allows for motions and some discussions to happen overnight, and that that helps to uh, make that uh, motion making on that item efficient on that second day. Now we're at the stock assessment plan, um, and here, as I indicated, the Science Center has indicated that they are ready to update all of us on how things are going with, on the stock assessment front and um, that that may induce a discussion here about um, uh, potentially charting a different pathway forward, which may mean pausing a stock assessment if things are not coming together well, but I don't want to put any words in anyone's mouth. And then we would start uh, the trawl catch share program and intersector allocation review. And then we've titled this as scoping. There was some talk in the gap statement about shrinking this agenda item down uh, from three hours and making it more precise. Uh, I will say I've had some similar thoughts if we were to focus, for instance, on the, the trawl cost efficiencies project um, that NIMS recently uh, received funding for. Uh, we could likely shrink that time estimate down uh, if we really focused on that particular question. Let's see, moving into Monday, uh, we have the white paper, uh, formerly known as Council and Process Efficiencies. Uh, this is something that um, the rest of the council staff and I have been working on. Um, uh, NIMP staff have sent us some ideas. Several of you have sent us some ideas. We'll be bringing forward a white paper, which I envision as the first step um, in, in a discussion about um, our operations moving forward and doing that efficiently and effectively. On ecosystems, we do have fishery ecosystem plan initiative update and final adoption of the initiative's appendix and the Western Regional Action Plan, which I touched on a few minutes ago. Ground fish, we have several matters, again, coming back and making uh, decisions then on the non-trawl area management late on Monday. And then on Tuesday, we get into uh, several highly migratory species items, uh, starting off the NIMS report and international management activities final recommendations on EFPs, harvest specifications, preliminary. And there is this matter of the swordfish management monitoring plan, which uh, triggered some comment that you heard uh, potentially the timeliness of that and maybe pushing that off. And then marine planning. And as uh, we heard, there is a desire by several advisory bodies to have this on the agenda. Um, 
Chairman Gorelnik asked a question about whether we could keep that really to two hours, and you did hear some feedback from the uh, chair of the GAP and the co-chair of the MPC about how we could structure that in a way that uh, could, could keep that to a, an efficient amount of time. And then on the final day, we have some several routine administrative matters. Let's see, um, the only other thing that comes to mind, Mr. Chairman, is uh, we are, of course, still trying to figure out our way out of this COVID situation. Uh, we are not out of it, as we learned this week. Um, and so we are, uh, you know, trying to envision how to move forward in September, given what we've learned here, given what we learned in March and April. And as I indicated earlier, we have thus far envisioned um, a scaled down meeting in person, uh, not quite as scaled down as we had in March, but uh, having fewer advisory bodies in person, uh, continuing to have the council ballroom as a hybrid model like we have been doing. Uh, I think this is going quite well the way we have it set up here um, and having uh, several of the other advisory bodies that you see scheduled, having them be remote. Uh, so that would be our proposal for that structure for you. I can't think of anything else to summarize at the moment, Mr. Chairman, so I'll stop there. Happy to take any questions. Happy to also ask Mr. Berner if I've missed anything that he thinks is important to raise. I'm not seeing any hands. I, I do now, Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Just are we moving into discussion here? Okay. I do have some um, thoughts, input, and maybe a question on the ground fish items for September. Um, I, I would just say uh, I thought the gap statement on the ground fish items uh, captured um, some good recommendations and they actually look like they've been also captured on this um, supplemental attachment four. Uh, so that looks um, really good to me. I wanted to um, support uh, the GMT's recommendation to um, add the descending device review onto the SSC's agenda. I think the gap also um, uh, asked for that too, so I, I I would appreciate that. I know um, that's really important information and folks are working hard on that. Um, in terms of the limited entry fixed gear follow on actions, um, we've been talking about it. I know there's interest in seeing that package go forward and I'm hoping that that is something that can be taken up under the workload and new management measure update. I just wanna confirm that. Um, that that's a, the place where we can take that. It doesn't need its own separate agenda item or anything like that. Um, and I'll, I'll leave room for follow up here in just a sec. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the non troll RCA range of alternatives and PPA regarding the um, alternative that is focused on Washington. Um, I don't think that we will be ready, I can probably say that more um, confidently, that we won't be ready to have be, have anything be considered for range of alternative in September. Um, we've talked quite a bit, I think going back to November, about um, wanting the Washington alternative to be kept separate, to not hold back any of this action for Oregon and California. So just want to reiterate that, um, allow the the um, those folks to to look at the Oregon and Washington maps. I mean, excuse me, Oregon and California maps. We we won't have any maps for review by September. Um, we still have work to do with our stakeholders. We still have um, work to do meeting with our tribal co-managers on this issue. I, I expect that we'll follow up on this, but but not in September. So I just wanted to add that here. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I'll, uh, Executive Director Burden. Just thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Hall, for uh, that guidance. Just a couple of follow up questions. Could you please, uh, first question is, could you please elaborate on your suggestion that 
we put the limited entry fix gear item under, I believe it was agenda planning. Um, that would be my first question. And then my second question is in regards to Washington's readiness under the uh, the non-trawl item. Uh, do you have a proposal for when that would come back, whether that be November or March, when Washington would be ready? Uh, thank you, Merrick. I, I don't have a an idea of when it would come back. I don't know that we would able be able to bring something back in November, um, but but March might be doable. We we do need some more time to talk about that um, at home with folks, but um, yeah, I hadn't thought about um, if not in September, then when, but so sorry, that may not be exactly what you're looking for, but um, on the limited entry fixed gear follow on action, I, I suggested it be discussed under workload and new management measure update. <laughs> oh, hopefully those were the words I said. <laughs> That's what I meant. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to say like Heather talked about, you know, I, I support the consensus that we hear from the gap in the GMT to add um, some of those shaded items like electronic monitoring to um, the agenda for September. Um, and I also want to thank the GMT for all their hard work and dedication, you know, really to provide council with the best information available to make some of these policy decisions. And therefore, I also support the recommendation um, that we ask the SSC to schedule a review at that September council meeting of the descending device mortality rate work produced by the GMT so that we can have that information to inform in-season management as needed, since we did hear from the public testimony support of that. Um, we also heard in the GMT report, there's this need for some current agenda items to be finalized before prioritizing other items, given kind of that analyst workload limitations. So I think I guess I would like a little bit more discussion about adding in that package into the workload prioritization and new management measures, given what we're hearing from the GMT's report stating that they may not be able to take on new items until items are kind of taken off the list or completed through FPA. So I'm not sure how that conversation would move forward on that new package. Well, we always seem to be asking lots of the GMT. Uh, Merrick, do you have a response? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I, I'm certainly, as a former GMT alumni, I am sympathetic to these workload constraints, and I think they've gotten to be even more intense than they were 15 years ago. Um, so a couple of matters come to mind right away as I look at September and then throughout the year on uh, groundfish matters. So um, one is uh, in particular the overlap of the trawl catch share program and the stable fish gear switching PPA. That affects certainly council staff um, and then also asking the GMT to weigh in on both of those, um, depending on how we structure it, starts to get to be a lot. Um, one thing that is coming to mind for me would be the following. So. Um, a, that we continue to make headway on trawl catch share program review, but we start um, with something more narrow. And we start by uh, pursuing the work that uh, NIMS recently got funded to look at the um, cost efficiency, look at cost efficiencies in the trawl program. Uh, we are making headway on securing a contractor, so that would add capacity to our midst for that work and that we view that item uh, rather narrowly as an update on our plan and how we intend to go forward. So that would be A, and then B would be to push the trawl catch share program from November into March and free up that amount of time so that we're not stacking the sable fish gear switching PPA and the trawl program review on top of one another. So that would be my first thought on those lines. Um, happy to entertain other thoughts, but um, yeah, that's my first response. Jessica. To the chair, thanks Merrick for those thoughts. And 
I would like to hear more too. It seems like what the GMT is also proposing is, and what is needed in these cases, is kind of that multi-year look for some of these required reviews. So as the council, when we see these items come forward, we can see, but pushing off one item is actually going to impact items into the future. Um, and one of my thoughts on that is acknowledging the GMT workload and that who would maybe be the best to ask to create one of these types of multi-year ground fish items at a glance, would that be council staff? And that, that could then be used in the future to lay out priorities and see how delaying or moving forward would impact future items. Mayor. Yes, thank you, Ms. Watson. Um, that is something that we uh, we do do in-house. We, we don't bring it here because it starts to get to be a lot to look at at once. Uh, one example that uh, Mr. Berner and I and Mr. Griffin were um, discussing earlier this week was a chart that would lay out all the EFH timelines, for instance, and those start to back up against one another. Um, and there are a lot of items like that, so program review type documents that we do need to take a multi-year look at. Um, if the council desires, we could uh, formalize that and put that in the briefing book so you're able to see the schedule and as it, as it looks. Uh, um, I think we'd be happy to do that, but I would, I would, uh, I guess, want to consider how to bring that to this discussion because it starts to become overload at some point, right? But we can certainly make that available to you if you're interested. Thank you, Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it sounds like we're focusing on September, so I'll do my comments on that for now. Um, starting with groundfish. Uh, I see the groundfish workload and new management measures item, it's, it's characterized as an update, and I do think it's important for the council to keep the option open to potentially adjust priorities within the scope of that. I think that's consistent with what we heard um, um, from us all regarding the fixed gear item. So again, not suggesting a wholesale prioritization exercise in, just, in September, just confirming uh, the scope of this item doesn't preclude, preclude any changes, and, and I think that's the case. Uh, also support what's been already said about unshading the items that are shaded uh, and of course bringing forward um, uh, the stock assessment prioritization and the, um, and the definitions. Regarding your comment, Merrick, on the trawl catch share program, I, I don't mind a narrow scope. I think it will be helpful to get some council feedback on the, the um, cost review we'll be doing, but I, I think we want to at least potentially have some ability to talk some process and schedule of, of, of how we will proceed with the overall review too. And I think I think that can be done even under a narrow scope. Shifting to HMS, um, I would support the management team's uh, recommendation uh, and, and actually share their concerns regarding their workload uh, and everything that's on their plates between now and year's end. Well, it's international meetings, bluefin strategy work, hard caps, <laughs> the weaker EFPs, the biennial specs coming up, uh, in addition to those outstanding tasks that the council has requested when we revisit swordfish monitoring and management plan. So, so I would support moving that uh, to the spring uh, to allow them to focus on that um, rather large workload they have uh, over the coming months. Um, we haven't noted it, but we did have a discussion in hard caps about potentially having some additional, or I would say the next iteration of Dr. Stowe's um, model that could be ready for the SSC review in September. So I would at least hope that if that is available, that we could add that to the SSC's agenda in September. Um, per pursuant to the discussion we had under hard caps. And then finally on salmon, um, we heard from the SDT that there are a few updates they need to provide the council to us in September, both on the KOHM and, and on SONC. Um, I have spoken with my folks, both the center and the region, and, and we actually will not have a NIMS report. We don't have anything at now to report under. Uh, so perhaps that agenda item could just be uh, uh, rename to allow those STT updates. I'm, and I, I don't have a suggestion now, but I'm happy to work with, with you American Council staff on the best way to notice it. And uh, that's all I have for September, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, John Ugaritz. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to touch on that HMS item that Ryan mentioned that the team had commented on. Uh, we actually just unshaded swordfish management and monitoring at our last meeting when we we're discussing agenda planning, and I think it's important that we keep it on there. Um, we had had some prior discussions, and this is going back a few meetings, about the plan and about what it would and wouldn't include and what we need to get there. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate the, the team's response this morning because I was unclear what workload they thought they had for this plan. And frankly, the items they mention are so far past and out of what the council is currently thinking in terms of HMS that I don't really see much value in those tasks anymore. And I would recommend that the team drop those tasks from their list. I think swordfish management and monitoring at the uh, September meeting should be a council discussion and scoping about the plan and about what the next steps are for it and what it should and shouldn't include. The plan as it stands does not need a simple revision, but it needs a complete re look and, and change and lots of new information. Um, and I think that some council discussion and scoping about that would be very valuable in September to then guide what happens in March or later under HMS items. Um, so I'd strongly recommend keeping that there with that context in mind. We are not, at least I am not, anticipating any work from the highly migratory species management team prior to that discussion because I think they need some direction before they do the work. Thank you, John. Christus Menson? Yeah. And then I'm going to come back to Merrick and see <laughs> how we're doing capturing these, these thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, think it is important to keep swordfish monitoring and management on the agenda. Um, this is a topic that comes up over and over and over again. Um, but I'm also in agreement with the hey, I think we need to take a step back and have kind of that holistic overarching conversation. We heard that in uh, Teresa's testimony this morning. Uh, we've certainly heard it from others um, within the HMS community on the commercial side um, and in some cases on the rec side, in addition to the environmental side of, of the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and I think just taking the time to really think about the strategy, is it swordfish only? Is it HMS? What do we really want this plan to look like would be beneficial and that would be time that's well spent. So I'll conclude my remarks there. Thank you. Mayor, um, Ryan, then we'll go back to Mayor. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to, to um, weigh back in here based on the discussion that just happened. Um, I'm, I'm okay with keeping it on with the context that was just discussed um, and with the clear understanding that no um, additional work will be done by the MT on this between now and then, but I am very uncomfortable and strongly oppose um, doing away with the task that the MT has been put forward on this. I completely disagree with that. It is, I think, especially looking at some of the um, import data and some of the uh, that were related in those tasks and what uh, and how that impacts our fishery, especially hearing some of the struggles we heard uh, with the buoy gear fleet right now. Uh, I think it's critical to the swordfish discussion. And I, and I think it's also I'm a little bit struggling with completely um, rescinding of council action here in workload planning without any robust discussion about it. So. Uh, so I'm happy to keep the SMMP on. Uh, I do think those are important pieces, uh, but I think Chris is right. It probably good is good to take a step back first and have some kind of broad 30,000-foot um, discussion uh, and happy to do that in September. Thanks. Phil Anderson. Yeah, just before Merrick does his wrap-up, I just had a quick comment on G3. For the September meeting, the electronic monitoring piece, um, the GEM PAC TAC group is uh, we've we've established a couple of subgroups that are working on um, video review protocols, timing, 
um, uh, percentage of review, those kinds of things. And we have another one that's work subgroup working on funding sole source versus third party and looking for um, mechanisms for industry to fund the program under the regulation. Um, I would anticipate a report, an update uh, be provided in September. I would, I would be, uh, I would recommend that that uh, we wouldn't need more than an hour for that. I mean, the, the update itself, we can provide ahead of time. Uh, the, the verbalization of that update, I think will be a matter of, of, of five or 10 minutes or so. Um, there may be some comment from the, in particular, the gap on the topics and, and the update. But um, so that's what I envision. We even talked to Brett a little bit about doing it with an informational report rather than agendizing it. But I, I think if you, if we keep it on there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see a need to uh, use more than an hour for it. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, John, you, Chris, your hand is up. Do you have another comment or question? Sorry, that was remaining. I'll take it down. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Burden. Corey? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, we're just wrapping up September here. I just um, wanted to put out um, that we heard from uh, Mr. Sam Rauch earlier in the week about the equity and environmental justice draft strategy. And he noted that um, that NIMS would be wanting to hear comments from us if we wanted to give them um, after that September meeting. So I was gonna propose um, adding that to the agenda. I'm glad you remembered that from earlier in the meeting. Ryan, did you have? No, no, I was highlighting the Corey one on the floor and I, I support adding that. All right, thank you very much. Mike Berner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just step back to some comments from Ms. Hall regarding uh, workload, which was just some council staff question about the non trawl action, particularly focused on the Washington alternatives. If I heard correctly, the Washington is still working with constituents to finalize those alternatives. So I guess the question from our staff, it's a heavy lift for us between now and September. Should we focus our analytical efforts on the Washington, uh, excuse me, the Oregon and California alternatives of that piece and, and just sit tight on the Washington alternatives at this point? Is that what we're hearing? I'm saying yeah, that. that's, ex that's exactly correct, um, Mike. Thank you for that and um, for making it clear. We want to be clear with the public that we're not, there's no expectation to come to September and look at any maps for Washington. So focus on Oregon and California. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to brief comment here that we, to respond to what we heard from, from Ms. Labriola during public comment uh, regarding uh, agenda item H1, the Fisher Ecosystem Plan Initiative update and final adoption of initiatives appendix. I'm just looking forward to seeing what the EWG brings back to the council in collaboration with the EAS, um, looking at a next couple of potential initiatives and that the um, council is planning to review those initiatives and um, begin work on one of them, which I think is consistent with where the council was in March. So just wanted to confirm that. Great, thank you. All right, Mr. Burden. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so thank you all for your feedback. I do have uh, a couple of items to make note of here. Uh, it might trigger some extra discussion, I'm not sure, but uh, let's see, starting at the top. So I did note that uh, Ms. Writings uh, would like to add uh, comments on the NOAA and equity and environmental justice strategy. Um, I don't have a proposal right now for exactly where that would fit, but there are a couple of matters that we've chopped back an hour or, or more here or there. So I believe we could uh, find time for that on this agenda. Um, starting with Thursday, um, you all would like to add a few things to the SSC agenda. So one is a review of the descending device um, and that that would come to the council floor under in season. Um, there was also a desire to have the SSC review the uh, latest 
uh, Steve Stowe's modeling effort on drift gill net hard caps, if that is um, if that is ready at that time. Moving into Friday, I made note uh, that Mr. Wolf indicated that there would not be a NIMS report under D1. So I struck that. I believe that was D1. Was that correct, Mr. Wolf? Yep. Uh, moving into Saturday, um, Ms. Hall indicated that uh, limited entry fixed gear management measure would go under the uh, G2 item. Mr. Anderson made note that under G3, we should be able to cut that back to one hour rather than two, and that that would be a, an update from the uh, our various GEM working groups. Um, moving into Sunday, <clears throat> uh, we did have some discussion here about uh, the state of Washington's readiness uh, for that item, and there was just some recent clarification that this would mean uh, staff would focus on Oregon and California. Washington may come back. Um, in March, uh, but that is yet to be seen. We then had an exchange about the trawl catch year program review and narrowing that. Uh, I made a proposal that we focus more specifically on the cost uh, efficiencies project. Mr. Wolf requested that we continue to have a discussion of process and schedule in addition to that narrow scope. I think that can be accommodated. Let's see, moving into Tuesday, um, we spent some time talking about uh, the swordfish management and monitoring plan. And I believe where we landed was to keep this on the agenda, um, but to have this more of a higher level uh, scoping level quest or discussion uh, on the part of the council. And let's see if there's anything else. I would note that Mr. Ugratz indicated early on in this agenda item that there may be some conflict with the EAS and EWG and the HMS and AS and HMS MT and some other um, advisory bodies. Um, if the EIS and EWG is remote, I don't see a problem moving that to another day to avoid that conflict and having them give any report that they would give uh, remotely as well on Monday. So I think that can be addressed. Um, let me see here. And then Ms. Watson and I did have an exchange about uh, the GMT workload. Uh, I had proposed pushing the trawl catch air program review scheduled now in November, pushing that back to March to alleviate some of that workload in addition to the narrowing of that item that I've already spoken to. So that is what I've captured, Mr. Chairman. So I'm happy to pause there and I see Mr. Berner has his hand up. Mr. Berner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point of clarification regarding the salmon business. Uh, I, I understand there won't be a NIMS report, but I also heard Mr. Wolf speak to maybe if we needed a separate agenda item to speak to the, the modeling effort. We heard from Dr. O'Farrell this week that we could use that half an hour for that. The way I'm looking at it, we have a cumulative hour and a half there, and I'll work with NIMS and our councils, uh, our SSC staff to see what's the best way to structure those two agenda items to, to address that matter, but thank you. Uh, Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to speak to um, the marine planning, so C3 that's shaded on the agenda for September. It seems like what we were hearing from um, the GAP as well as the MPC is that could potentially be more of an informational report based on some of our discussions earlier under marine planning. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that that could be more informational. Mr. Anderson. Very small point, but just the, on the electronic monitoring, you'll receive an update from the Jim PAC TAC slash TAC committee. It won't be the subcommittees, but just. Yeah, I'd like to touch on, on marine planning, and I appreciate that it may be more of an informational item, but once it appears on the agenda, and with all the things going on over the summer, you know that there will be considerable public comment. And I think at this meeting, uh, we easily had close to an hour of public comment in addition to roughly an hour presentation. Um, and that doesn't count advisory bodies and discussions. So I, I think the two hours for marine planning um, I just don't think it's realistic. I think it needs to be at least even optimistically three, but preferably more time than that. It was four and a half hours at this meeting and scheduled for two.
So I don't know if you have, you know, there's going to need to be some moving around of some of these items. And typically we give council staff the discretion uh, to do that. Um, and if we provide that discretion, um, I guess I would look to council staff to see if they have any, if there's any need any clarity on direction or to turn to the council and see if there's any more direction. Mr. Burden. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I, I would say that is consistent with practice is that we, we do not ask you to make motions here so that we can go back and massage this into shape. Um, the, there are, as I'm looking here, there are some things that we would need to consider moving around to fit in, but I, I believe we do have the available time. Um, and it's just a matter of Mr. Berner and I sitting down and mapping this out. I, I don't see any obstacles at the moment to fitting in what we've talked about. Great. I, I hope that is sufficient. That's good news. So let me see if you have, if you have no need for further direction, let me give, uh, the council an opportunity. Um, Marcy Yaremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on that last point about the flexibility of moving things around, um, completely support that. And guess would just flag that right now it looks like we have both Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th as full ground fish days as slated. And just wanting to note that those days where it's a full day of ground fish content, it's difficult. Um, to make sure we're coordinating with our staff and that there's um, adequate um, time to communicate. So um, just when you're finalizing the schedule and looking at moving things around, um, at least from my view, it's helpful to have another subject matter in the mix on those days. Thank you. All right. Mr. Wolf. Yeah, sorry for taking the floor again, Merrick, and I know you said this, but there's some confusion amongst our folks. Can you just clarify which advisory bodies you were thinking in person in September? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Wolf. Um, I think it is important to clarify. So at the moment, we are envisioning in person for HMS and groundfish, both of, both of the HMS and both of the groundfish bodies. The others, aside from those that are staffed by council members, of course, the others would be remote. Okay, is there anything further for the good of the council under this agenda item or anything else folks want to say? John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I was sort of waiting for September to end, but the uh, HMSMT made some recommendations on year at a glance that affect November. Um, we heard public comment on those regarding uh, moving DGN performance metrics making EFH an update um, and possibly not being ready for DJ and hard caps. I just want to say that uh, I'm fine with the performance metrics moving. I think their rationale was good um, and an update on EFH makes sense. With regard to hard caps, I uh, feel that we should keep this on the November agenda. It's been longstanding council desire to get this done. Uh, I think that if the analyses are complete by November, that we can get to a final preferred alternative then. And uh, I hope we are striving towards that. Uh, if something comes up in September or November where we're not ready, we can address it at that time. Thank you, John. Merrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ugaritz. Um, just a couple of questions of clarification, just to make sure that we are uh, of the same mind here. So in terms of the Drift Gillnet bycatch performance report, there was talk um, uh, earlier of moving that to June 2023. And so my first question is, is, is that your proposal at the moment? And then you referenced EFH, I believe the uh, HMSMT had proposed that for November. And is that also uh, your intention? Thank you, through the chair. Uh, 
Thanks, Merrick. Yes, um, I think the MT made a good rationale for moving performance metrics to June 2023 and for providing just an update on EFH in um, November. Okay. So anything else for us for our September meeting or the year at a glance? Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted um, to state that given ODFW is currently in the process of recruiting for our permanent ODFW seat on the SSC, that ODFW appreciates the SSC continuing to engage um, with us about methodology reviews coming up in, that have been discussed, especially for our fishery independent hook and line surveys in, in those based on the commonalities between those and those in California. Thank you. All right, anything else, Mr. Wolf? Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, since we're talking about the AI, I'm, I'm fine with the uh, suggestions made by Mr. Ugaritz. I, I do think we should talk again maybe in September of how hard caps is noticed in March and I mean, not being pre-decisional that we would skip a, a PPA, but we can revisit that then. Um, I'd also note that per the COP too, we might want to add uh, a, a potential final action on specs for HMS in March. Sometimes that happens, it, it would be shaded and we would know more as we get there if, if we're going to need that additional meeting um, as the international scene unfolds. Um, and then uh, at some point we'll probably want to put uh, the non-trawl RCA final action on here. I know the MT recommended in March. Um, so maybe that could be shaded there. Uh, but again, we can have that discussion as we get closer in September. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Murden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize, Mr. Wolf. I was putting down my pen thinking we were done. And uh, so your comments caught me off guard a bit. Could you uh, please recap? You, you said a PPA somewhere. No, I just said we can revisit how hard caps is noticed in November when we talk in September. Um, um, like the MT report said, but I'm fine with what uh, John suggested. Uh, the only thing I'd suggest was adding uh, specs. Sometimes we have to carry on into March for final action per our COPS and depending on what happens with some of the international assessments. Um, so that would be shaded in March. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else on the uh, for September or the AG? Anything else, period? Mr. Pettinger. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Girls. Like I, I just like to say that um, just great work by the staff and the advisor bodies. And I mean, we're done early most days. And that just shows that people were, you know, getting things done and um, making things efficient. And uh, just congratulations to all those folks for all their hard work and um, to make it uh, not a late day like we had to during the uh, virtual world. So anyway, uh, job all done. Great, thanks. Thanks for acknowledging the staff, which is the reason why we get anything done. All right, uh, if there's nothing further on this agenda item, there's one further item that we need to handle before we can leave. Mr. Hassamer. Thanks, Mr. Chair, I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Seconded by Butch Smith. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone, for a great meeting. Thank you. And I um, will see you all in September in Boise, Idaho. <laughs>